of the meeting of the House Energy and Commerce Committee as members continue marking up energy and climate change Today legislation we'll chaired by Henry Waxman. The, uh, it's live on C-SPAN 3. The clerk will inform us of the uh, pending amendment. It's the Scalise Mr. Chairman, amendment. When the committee recessed, uh, pending was the amendment offered by Mr. Scalise okay. to Title II. Who wishes to be recognized? Uh, Mr. Welch. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, a couple of things. First, uh, Mr. Scalise, I think, made some good points about enforcement. And the the, uh, Mr. Matheson has addressed that with an amendment that we'll have an opportunity to vote on. Uh, it'll make it much more reasonable and realistic and uh, user friendly. So, Mr. Scalise, thank you for pointing those things out. And I'm delighted that Mr. Matheson, uh, I believe, has addressed them with the amendment that we're soon going to have an opportunity to vote on. Uh, second, I want to address some of your concerns about the one size fits all. Uh, that's something I'm certainly sensitive to, uh, being from a rural state. Uh, where many of the uh, uh, large programs don't really fit us. Uh, I have a, a significant concern about that uh, very, very question. Uh, but I've looked into how that applies to this bill, and it doesn't. Uh, it, it, this is not a one-size-fits-all nationwide code. First, and this is tremendously important, all states and localities could have their energy efficiency codes certified if they meet the energy efficiency uh, percentage improvement goals. So the power is going to be in the local community uh, to do it the best way that they can and take into account, I believe, uh, some of the concerns that uh, you are not unique in having about wanting your folks to be able to take appropriate decisions for their own individual needs. Second, the secretary would only determine the national energy efficiency code after the normal code setting consensus based organizations fail to adopt a national code that meets the efficiency targets. Third, they would have unprecedented federal support in attempting to reach those levels. That's a really important thing. You know, a lot of times there are these unfunded mandates where one level of government tells another what to do and doesn't provide them with the resources to get the job done. We're not doing that here. We're really putting out a partnership plan that enables the states and the localities to do, uh, to do this at the local level. Fourth, if both the states and the code organizations in fact fail, uh, then the secretary at that point has to has the power to determine the code, but he's instructed to base his code on the consensus codes that, in fact, have been uh, proposed and previously adopted. And in fact, uh, I'm going to hold up here the uh, the uh, International Energy Conservation Code, and this is the 2009 version. And almost all of the states and federal government, in fact, use this code now as a baseline, and it is not a one-size-fits-all. It provides for six, count them, six different climate zones in which different variations of the energy efficiency code would apply. It has 11 pages that detail every county. That's not every state. That's every county in the United States and indicate which of these microclimate efficiency codes should be applied to that county. So uh, far from being a one-size-fits-all, this is a one-idea-fits-all. And that's the question for us. Do we believe in the idea of efficiency? And if we do, then we'll give flexibility on implementation as long as one part of the country that's doing it their way is meeting the standards that achieve the one idea fits all, that we're going to save money, build jobs, and clean the environment, starting with efficiency. Uh, I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back the balance of his time. Is there further debate? Ms. Myrick. Yes, I, I have a question, Mr. Chairman, thank you, of Consul or whoever can answer it, regarding the Energy Star um, um, rating on windows. Um, I was told that the, in order to qualify for the tax credits through this bill, that the Energy Star rating that we used to have is no longer good on a particular window and that they have to move up to a higher cost window in order to qualify. 
and what that will force people to do is buy a cheaper window that doesn't have any rating at all if they get no tax credit. Is that? Um, Mrs. Myrick, first, there is nothing in this bill on tax credits because, of course, that's not in our jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. Um, there is nothing in this provision that deals directly with windows. Windows would be one of the parts of a building right. shell that would right. be subject to code provisions. So if a but this efficiency th code required um, a certain level of window, that would have to meet code. In many cases, one can improve windows and do something else less in order to meet the overall code target. Um, but there's nothing in this bill that goes to the question at all, or nothing in this section that goes to the question at all of energy star windows one way or the other. Okay, thank you. A gentlelady yields back the balance of her time. I'd like to recognize a yes, representative from Tennessee. Thank you, Mr. Speak Chairman. I appreciate that. I uh, move to strike the last word. I, I do have a question of counsel. I'm, I'm going through the bill. Uh, page 233, if you want to look starting at line 7, where it talks about noncompliance. And it shows that through this, I want to be sure I'm understanding this right, because I think this is something we will hear from our state and local governments on. So I've kind of got a two-part question for you. And then I want to yield to the author of uh, his amendment to address uh, his striking of this section. But the way I'm reading this is that if a state is out of compliance in their building codes, in other words, if they have not accepted the federal mandate and have put that in place in their building codes, then year one, they're out of compliance. They lose 25% of the funds that would come under this American Clean Energy and Security Act of 09, which would be cap and trade. Then year two, it's 50%. Year three, it's 75%. And then fourth year and all subsequent years for which the state is out of compliance, 100% is, is gone. So I would like for you to address that. And then secondly, what happens if a local government is in compliance, but the state government is not in compliance? What if a local government has said, we accept these building codes, we have changed to meet the federal standard, but then the state does not? And I yield to you for the response. OK, thank you. Um, t taking the second part of your question first, because that's right in front of me, at the top of page 233, there is a local compliance section that says, in any state that is out of compliance with this section, as could provide in subparagraph A, a local government may be in compliance with this section by meeting all certification requirements applicable to the state. Yes. What happens to that local government's funding? They because won't receive. That is, okay, because the remainder of that provision is silent on that funding stream, oh, two page, two unless there's something there that I am not, yes. not seeing. On page 237, 237. In paragraph okay. 2, it states that in the instance that the Secretary certifies that one or more local governments are in compliance with this section, the administrator shall provide to each such local government the portion of the emission allowances okay. That would have been provided to the state. That is for the emission allow allowances, and are we to assume then that any other funds that would be directed to th this would be unencumbered to that local government? Uh, yes. The, okay. The, the bill provides emission allowance value to support this process, so that the states and the local governments do not have to uh, to depend on separate value from else. So that is not only the allowances, but all funds. OK. That, that, that would be our Thank you. I, I appreciate that clarification. And I yield to the author. Well, I have the oh, first part of your question. First part, yes, go ahead. And the first part of your question um, goes to the, the timing of certification of state compliance. And a state would have two years after a target was set and one year after a code was adopted to become in compliance or to demonstrate adequate progress toward meeting compliance. And that is up to a seven-year period to, to receive the support 
even while out of compliance, if they're making adequate progress toward compliance. And it would only be after the expiration of a, a full period that the reduction of emission allowance value to that state would begin. So it's a very long period to be in compliance. Okay. So in total then, for our local governments and our state governments, you are saying you would give them a seven-year window to meet this compliance? That is correct. Okay. Just thank you for the clarification. And I yield to the gentleman from Louisiana the remainder of my time. I thank the gentlelady from Tennessee. And in the limited time I've got, uh, I will say there is one more uh, off-ramp, if you want to call it that, for states. It's on page 228. It said, for the purposes of meeting the target described in subsection here, a state that adopts the code represented in California's title shall be considered to have met the requirement. So the only state mentioned in here is California. So I, you basically, if you follow California's code, now we don't have earthquakes in Louisiana. I'm sorry that they do. Uh, but our our problems and challenges aren't the same as theirs. But if you go to the Matheson Amendment, I just went to the desk and got it, it still says in his amendment, the, sec the secretary shall determine and adopt by rule what shall constitute violations and the penalties that shall apply. So you still have a global warming Gestapo. They just take some of the language out so that people can't tell what it's really doing. Uh, so I think it, it actually decreases some of the disclosure that's in this bill. But the bottom line is this bill gives the secretary to civilly fine citizens who are in their house, the senior citizen who in the Midwest had a tornado destroy her house and wants to rebuild it, if she doesn't rebuild it according to this federal code, she's now going to be considered, according to their own language, an unlawful occupant of her own home. Now, they just won't use that terminology anymore, but they'll still give them the ability under that amendment to go and find them. So the ability is there. We need to take this section out. Time has expired. Uh, I'd like to ask a question of the gentleman. What you say? You said go, global warming Gestapo. What does that mean? It, it basically is the powers that are vested in the secretary under Section 201 of this, this cap and trade energy tax to go in to someone's house, number one, to go in and then charge them. The, the government would be so able to. So if anybody do does something do you don't like, you call them court, Gestapo. But then if they're in violation, they would be able, they, the terminology you used in your own bill, Mr. Chairman, is what, what do you unlawful think of occupancy. The, uh, that's, people that's who run Gestapo other government agencies. You think the government is made up of Gestapo people? I don't think the government should be able to tell somebody if they're in their home and they're living in their home, abiding by all of the laws, that they're an unlawful occupant of their house. The, that's the terminology in I this would, bill. That's I'd, frightening. I would welcome the, the uh, expression of your point of view, but I, I, would, I would like to request that perhaps that's a little strong to say Gestapo. It's strong language. I, I'd be very interested in seeing who came up with this term on page 236. Each day of unlawful occupancy. Gentlemen's time has expired. Separate violation. Uh, who else wishes to speak on the uh, Scalise Amendment? Yes, gentleman from Illinois. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I do want to raise uh, uh, support of my colleague from Louisiana um, and just highlight a couple of the, the issues that he has raised. Um, we did have this debate on energy and energy efficiencies over the years. And one of the concerns was where is the arbitrary line of where you delineate regional boundaries? Um, again, in the issue of uh, heating and cooling, uh, heat pumps versus natural gas furnaces versus um, all electric, who is best to decide? And I, and I think, again, the problem that many of us have on this side is the uh, centralized authority, big government, Washington dictates how best we are to live. And the overall problem that, that I continue to have had, and, and this is the full committee mark, and for my colleagues who are on other committees and, and don't serve on the energy and air quality subcommittee, these are things that, that, that I've said before. I mean, it's not, this isn't new in essence, uh, rhetoric for me. But what we do are doing with this bill and is having the federal government tell individual homeowners what type of house they live in. We, we are going to dictate what kind of cars we drive. We are going to dictate what kind of fuels we use. We are going to dictate eventually how far away we live from the urban center. Uh, centralization run amok. 
why not allow, as my, my colleague from Louisiana has stated, the states, under the concept of federalism, to set building codes? Why not allow states, under the concept of federalism, to establish building codes? Why usurp states' rights and intervene in the, in the management of what state lawmakers do based upon the specific regions of the country that they represent? Even the state of Illinois, which is a very large state, um, again, I, many people know there's some areas I, it takes me three hours to drive from one point. Well, I'm, I live five hours from Chicago. So to get from the southern part of the state of Illinois, which is across from my colleague Ed Woodfield in Paducah, Kentucky, to get up to the Wisconsin border is probably an eight and a half to nine hour drive. What different geographical regions do you go through from purely southern to Midwesterner till you, till you get up into the upper Midwest. Three different regions. The state of Illinois has trouble establishing its own building code to meet its own energy needs. And we're going to think the federal government is going to do better? Uh, that's the affront of this bill, an attack on federalism. And, and as the folks in Louisiana, we, we had some talk about hurricanes uh, last night. If the state of Louisiana decides to emplace building codes to protect it from those areas that would damage it the most, which they did two years ago, who are we to say no or revise those standards or say now you don't get, you, you, you don't comply. In fact, we use the traditional federal government uh, activity of extortion by saying, if you don't comply, guess what? No money. If you don't comply, no money. And, and we do that all the time. And, I, and, and we were attacked numerous times when we were in the majority about our belief in states' rights and walking away. And I know council's smiling because they've heard this debate before. Well, now we're back to that argument. Now it's our turn to say, when you guys were defending state rights and attacking us, where are you now? You are in direct opposite of what you all did years ago to attack us for not applying to the principles of states' rights and the principles of federalism. So I would caution you for people who believe in life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I think the founding fathers, had they realized that personal property could be attacked by the federal government would have written property in our founding founding documents. And uh, I wish they would have because it's under assault. Gentlemen's time has expired. Mr. Murphy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'd refer the gentleman to the text of the section and back to points that Mr. Welsh made. We're not setting one national code that usurps state building codes. Uh, in fact, we are setting national guidelines for building energy efficiency that will then have to be met by individual state codes. And the question is why? Why do that? And the gentleman brings up a good point. Why should the federal government uh, set these national guidelines, even if we're not getting into the micromanagement of codes? And it's very simple. It's very simple. The same Constitution that Mr. Scalise put into the record at the beginning of his introduction of this amendment also suggests that this country and this Congress have an obli obligation to provide for the common defense. Set aside our national interest in combating global warming. Every single dollar that we send in energy costs to Iran, to Russia, to the Middle East compromises this country's national security. We have absolute national interests from an environmental and a national security side in saying to states, do this yourself, set the parameters so that it makes sense for your own state. I don't want Connecticut's code to be like Louisiana's. I know it has to be different. But we have a constitutional obligation to provide for the security of this country. And whether we like it or not, the amount of energy that we continue to consume and the amount of money that we send overseas is interrelated to the defense and the security of this nation. So I, I understand the gentleman's 
uh, caution that we shouldn't get into the business of telling every single state what to do. Um, but we absolutely have a national interest in how much energy these buildings suck up. And I think it's the underlying reason why you see it in this amendment. And I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back the balance of his time. Are we ready for the question? Mr. Chairman, who is, may I just one, two The gentleman is recognized. Yes. Thank you very much. I think the bottom line here is we always recognize that there is a balancing act in any action of government. The fact is the people most affected by this piece of legislation, the National Home Builders Association, the Realtors Association, are all very much opposed to this provision of the bill. I think Mr. Scalise's amendment should be supported. It's easy for us to sit up here and talk in macro terms. But when you're down there building these houses, building commercial buildings, trying to get the permits, trying to meet the requirements of this new federal guideline, and there are penalties involved in not meeting these guidelines, particularly each day of unlawful occupancy, and that means a building that does not meet the code shall be considered a separate violation in the event a building constructed out of compliance has been conveyed by a knowing builder or seller to another person, that's another violation. We have a retrofitting provision in here for all existing buildings uh, so that we can bring them in compliance. And I don't think any of us have any idea of how much money that would cost. But for the federal government, to be setting these guidelines and requiring states and local governments to meet these guidelines is what I think is really micromanaging. And I think one of the common complaints all of us here from builders and everybody else is the number of permits, the process that you have to go through to build a building. And this is going to make it even more cumbersome, more difficult to deal with, more expensive, and uh, I would urge uh, support of the amendment of Mr. Scalise. And I would yield uh, to the gentleman from Arizona. I thank the gentleman for yielding. And uh, I think that uh, it is fair for our constituents across America to listen to this debate and hear the good intentions of the members of this committee as they craft the wording of this bill. But it's more important for them to actually look, actually look at the language of the bill and to face the reality of the conflicting codes and requirements and penalties that they're going to be exposed to. And if we think that good intentions expressed here about, well, nobody would really impose a uniform standard and nobody would enforce this in an unreasonable way, uh, that simply is not the way uh, that government is perceived out across America and for good reason. Uh, I, I believe that this kind of is a microcosm reflection of this entire bill. We have chosen to decide that the marketplace and the cost of energy will not solve these problems on its own, that people won't make rational decisions to lower their energy bill, they won't reduce the, the uh, uh, costs of operating their companies, they'll just go on unless we mandate a solution. My wife and I built a home uh, four years ago. Uh, it's in Phoenix, Arizona. It's very, very hot in Phoenix, Arizona. Our prior home was extremely well insulated for its day. But I decided when I was building the new home that I would go above and beyond and I put every form of insulation into that home that I could possibly think of. Uh, my brother, who's a home builder in Tucson, Arizona, uh, pointed out that there was a new reflective film that you could put on the underside of the roof rafters uh, and that he was in homes where this was being used and the temperature on the side of the home where they'd installed it was 5, 8, 10 degrees cooler than the temperature on the opposite side of the home where they hadn't finish the installation. I couldn't find a contractor in Phoenix that would install that form of insulation or that form of reflective material uh, in the Phoenix area. So I went, driven by the market forces, driven by my own paycheck, uh, and found a contractor in Tucson. He found an associate in Phoenix, and we got it installed in our home. Uh, I would caution you that uh, this bill is becoming so bizarre and so Byzantine in its micro uh, requirements of every single thing, all the way down to we're setting uh, standards, which I think we're going to address in an amendment fairly soon, on uh, jacuzzis, what jacuzzis work and don't work. Well, are we going to look at whether a jacuzzi in Phoenix, Arizona must meet a different standard where it's 120 in the heat of the summer than one in, we'll say, uh, Massachusetts? 
Uh, we're setting standards for art lighting. I, I don't know how many of you have art lighting in your homes, but I don't. Uh, I think Mr. Scalise's amendment uh, is headed in the right direction. I believe that micromanagement of the entire economy and of every aspect of these things is not, in fact, <clears throat> the solution to our problem, and that market forces encouraging people to be prudent with their expenditures. Indeed, the idea of raising the cost of energy in this bill will achieve the goal you want without the prescriptive solutions of this legislation. And I yield back the balance of my time. Uh, time has expired. The Chair would like to now put the question on the Scalise Amendment. Uh, you're going to want to roll call? Yeah. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Waxman. No. Mr. Waxman votes no. Mr. Dingle. Votes no. Mr. Dingle votes no. Mr. Markey. Mr. Boucher. Mr. Pallone. Mr. Gordon. Mr. Rush. Ms. Eshoo. Ms. Eshoo votes no. Mr. Stupak. Mr. Stupak votes no. Mr. Engel. Mr. Green. Mr. Gett. Mr. Gett votes no. Mrs. Capps. Mrs. Capps votes no. Mr. Doyle. Mr. Doyle votes no. Ms. Harmon. Ms. Harmon votes no. Ms. Joukowsky. Mr. Gonzalez. Mr. Gonzalez votes no. Mr. Inslee. Mr. Inslee votes no. Ms. Baldwin. Ms. Baldwin votes no. Mr. Ross. Mr. Weiner. Mr. Weiner votes no. Mr. Matheson. Mr. Matheson votes no. Mr. Butterfield. Mr. Butterfield votes no. Mr. Melanson. Mr. Barrow. Mr. Barrow votes no. Mr. Hill. Mr. Hill votes no. Ms. Matsui. Ms. Matsui votes no. Mrs. Christensen. Mrs. Christensen votes no. Ms. Castor. Ms. Castor votes no. Mr. Sarbanes. Mr. Murphy of Connecticut. Mr. Murphy votes no. Mr. Space. Mr. Space votes no. Mr. McNerney. Mr. McNerney votes no. Ms. Sutton. Ms. Sutton votes no. Mr. Braley. Mr. Welch. Mr. Barton. Mr. Barton votes aye. Mr. Hall. Mr. Upton. Mr. Upton votes aye. Mr. Stearns. Mr. Stearns votes aye. Mr. Deal. Mr. Whitfield. Mr. Whitfield votes aye. Mr. Shimkus. Mr. Shimkus votes aye. Mr. Shattuck. Mr. Shattuck votes aye. Mr. Blunt. Mr. Blunt votes aye. Mr. Booyer. Aye. Mr. Booyer votes aye. Mr. Radonovich. Aye. Mr. Radonovich votes aye. Mr. Pitts. Aye. Mr. Pitts votes aye. Ms. Bono Mack. Ms. Bono Mack votes aye. Mr. Walden. Aye. Mr. Walden votes aye. Mr. Terry. Aye. Mr. Terry votes aye. Mr. Rogers. 
Mr. Rogers votes aye. Mrs. Myrick. Mrs. Myrick votes aye. Mr. Sullivan. Mr. Murphy of Pennsylvania. Mr. Burgess. Mr. Burgess votes aye. Ms. Blackburn. Ms. Blackburn votes aye. Mr. Gingry. Mr. Gingry votes aye. Mr. Scullis. Mr. Scullis votes aye. Ms. Mr. Green. Mr. Green votes no. Ms. <laughs> Ms. Schakowsky. Ms. Schakowsky votes no. Mr. Pallone. Mr. Pallone votes no. Mr. Gordon. Mr. Gordon votes no. Mr. Rush. Mr. Rush votes no. Mr. Sarbanes. Mr. Sarbanes votes no. Mr. Ross. Mr. Ross votes no. Mr. Markey. Mr. Markey votes no. Mr. Deal. Mr. Deal votes aye. Have all members been recorded? Any members wish to change his or her vote? Not the clerk will tally the vote. Mr. Chairman, on that vote, the, the yeas were 20 and the nays were 31. Uh, 20 ayes, 31 noes. The amendment's not agreed to. Mr. Matheson, do you have an amendment at the desk? Uh, yes, I do, Mr. On Chairman. this title? Yes, I do. It's on title two. Clerk will report the amendment. Amendment offered by Mr. Matheson of Utah. Without Page objection, the amendment will be considered as read. The gentleman is recognized to explain his amendment. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, as we discussed during this uh, debate on Point the of order. Mr. Chairman, could we get copies before it's discussed? We'll, uh, Mr. Matheson, you will hold a minute. The copies are being distributed now. Thank you. Mr. Matheson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As we discussed, uh, when it comes to the issue of uh, building and commercial structures, there is a huge opportunity for efficiency gain. But the discussion also mentioned the notion that there is a fine line between bringing building codes up to par while avoiding an overreach by the federal government. Uh, many people are concerned about Section 201, which would um, insert the federal government into this issue more, and particularly the issue of establishing a new federal cause of action against the property owner for noncompliance. Uh, this is a significant departure from existing law and construction practice. It may have unintended consequences. Uh, building owners shouldn't be held responsible for the deficiencies of state and local building codes, some of which have not been updated for years. When codes are tough, builders will build to those standards. This amendment removes elements of the federal enforcement language. It allows the Energy Secretary to address this issue in a public rulemaking, taking into account stakeholder concerns. It also allows the Secretary to take a hard look at the complex issue of federal involvement with local building code violations. The Department will have the opportunity to assess similarities between local and state building code and property laws in order to avoid duplication. Um, I would describe this amendment as a good first step. Uh, personally, I still have some concerns about the stakeholder process and the degree to which the government, the federal government would be involved or should be involved in this issue. Um, but I do think this is a good first step. I would mention that this amendment is supported by the Building Owners and Managers Association, the International Council of Shopping Centers, the National Association of Real Estate Investment Trusts, and the Real Estate Roundtable. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. The gentleman yields back his time. Is there further discussion? Mr. Barton. I'd like to ask uh, the Arthur and the Council some questions. If this, if this amendment is accepted and adopted and actually becomes law, 
who would what would be the enforcement agency of a violation? Would it be at the local level or at the state level or the federal level? Either. If a state or local code was certified, enforcement would be part of that code and be undertaken by the state or local code agency that had the code in effect. If that did not happen and a federal code were adopted under this, then the enforcement would fall to, this, to the Secretary of Energy, but this amendment prescribes that he determines what kind of enforcement that would be through a rulemaking process um, with a three-year deadline so that there is uh, <coughs> the opportunity for all stakeholders to um, help him determine what constitutes a violation and if there is a violation, what kind of penalty. And, would and could that rulemaking result in the decision that the enforcement be at the local level? Under this statute, if, if this became, became law and we were in a position where there were a federal code, then it, it would not result in state enforcement of the federal code. But a state can at any time under this provision certify its own code, get that to be compliant. I understand that part of that. Could I ask the author what his intent is here? What is it that you're in? Look, I think the effort here is to get stakeholders at the table and talk about what the best way is to go about doing this. And it requires that the Secretary would have to uh, determine if it requires any additional statutory authority and has to come back to this Congress to ask for it if they determine they need more statutory authority. As I said, I think this is a good first step. I may have some other issues with this too, but I think this at least takes away this new federal cause of action that I think was the most uh, disconcerting aspect of the legislation that's written right now. With those um, questions answered, I think the minority is prepared to accept the amendment. Let's proceed to a vote on the Matheson Amendment. All those in favor of the amendment say aye. 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 Opposed, no. The ayes have it and the amendments agreed to. Mr. Stearns, for what purpose do you seek recognition? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. Is that amendment to this title, too? Uh, that's correct, and I believe okay. it's been in. Clerk will report the amendment. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute offered by Mr. Stearns of Florida. Strikes, strike section 204. Gentleman's recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, let me say to my colleagues on the uh, majority side, uh, when I had an amendment that was talking about labeling of utility bills to find what the cost would be for renewable energy and to see how much it would go up because of the implementation of this bill, a lot of people on the other side said, no, they didn't want to have that labeling. Well, now I think you could support this amendment. I say this a little bit humorously because what this uh, amendment does is delete a section of the manager's amendment which calls on a detail building energy performance labeling program. Just to give you a little bit of idea of what the manager's amendment says, it talks about not later than 90 days after the date of enactment of this piece of legislation, the administrator, which is the EPA, shall provide to Congress, as well as to the Secretary Energy of Energy and the Office of Management and Budget, a report identifying all principal building types, this is in the United States of America, for which statistically significant energy performance data exist to serve as a basis of measurement protocols and labeling requirements for achieved building energy performance. Well, this section goes on quite a bit. And it talks about all this complex matter of setting up labels that you can put on every house in America so that it will be identified whether it is energy conservation, energy efficient. So what my amendment does is eliminate this EPA regulation, which is basically establishing an Energy Star labeling on new and existing homes. Now think about that. All the existing homes in America will have to have this brand new Energy Star. Now, this is an amendment that's supported by the National Association of Realtors, 
I have a letter from them, Mr. Chairman, and I ask unanimous consent that the letter from the National Association of Realtors be made part of the record, Mr. Chairman. Hopefully, I ask this be made part of the record. The, uh, the letter. Without objection, that will be the order. Okay. Which outlines in detail their objection to this portion of the manager's amendment? You know, frankly, my colleagues, if you have an older home and they put this energy star on it and it says your home ain't good, your home will be stigmatized as not only less energy efficient in an older property, but it's going to reduce the value of your home. Now, reducing the value of your home at a time when many homeowners have seen their equity and the retirement savings vanish is not in the best in my view, the best means of action, and we should not put forward this, this section because in 90 days, the Secretary of Energy and the EPA are going to identify every home in America existing and try to put these labels on it. Now, labels do not necessarily save energy. Home improvements do. So let's say you get this label. Then immediately your house is degraded and it's lost value. You don't have the money because you're unemployed or you don't have the money because you lost money in your 401k. So you're going to read the label as a buyer and you're going to say, I'm not going to take that house, whereas it might not scare you away otherwise. Consumers would then have to voluntarily take the next step and act on the data that the EPA and the Secretary of Energy have come up with to install these energy saving measures. And it's going to have to be done voluntarily. They won't have the money. There's no assurance that the buyers will install these measures once they successfully use the label at the closing to negotiate their home by discounting the price. I just think this is not the way to go. It's hugely, hugely bureaucratic. And the people on that side talked about my amendment when I talked about determining how much the renewables would cost on our utility bills, they talked about the bureaucracy and so forth. This is going to be very bureaucratic, and I'm not sure there's data available to identify every single home in America to do this. Because the energy profile of a home varies dramatically from one to the next. It might be a house of historical, classical nature, and it might not be. There's so many variables involved. And so that's why I urge my colleagues to support this amendment and is supported by the National Association of Realtors. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen's time has expired. Further debate on this amendment? Yeah, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Harmon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I first want to say that uh, our colleague Jim Matheson uh, uh, offered an excellent amendment, which we have accepted by voice vote. It is. Uh, uh, it was intended to meet some of the concerns that have been offered by the uh, realtor uh, group uh, about building labeling, and I think it was a responsible amendment, and I'm very happy that it will become part of the base text. In this case, however, Mr. Stearns, uh, I think that adjustments have already been made to the base text, which go a long way to meeting the objections of the realtors. I'm sorry that they don't support uh, what is now in the bill, but I just want to remind us uh, what is in the bill and, and what changes have been made and speak in opposition to the Stearns Amendment. First of all, um, buildings represent 39 percent of annual U.S. energy use. That's a big deal, and so it matters that we make them as efficient as possible. Second of all, the underlying text creates a national labeling model. It's optional, rating buildings' uh, energy efficiency. Uh, one that would make it easy to count carbon and energy costs similar to a nutrition label. I look at nutrition labels, and if I'm buying a new home, I, I would like to look at that label as well. Uh, the realtors are very concerned that the program would be mandatory, and their concerns were met. The, the program is voluntary. States can opt in or not. It is basically a consumer right to know amendment, and the other side has been all about the little guy getting hurt, uh, I think consumers should know uh, the efficiency of, uh, of uh, places they are purchasing, and also they should have the opportunity to save money on their energy bills because they buy more efficient uh, or rent more efficient structures. 
Uh, so let me conclude that uh, by saying that I think consumers deserve uh, as much information as possible. Uh, this allows them to, who, those who want energy efficiency, energy efficient homes to uh, uh, purchase those. Uh, sellers may not only improve uh, curb appeal, but also improve energy efficiency in the homes that they are going to sell. I think this uh, takes us in the right direction and it will make a huge uh, improvement in, uh, in our, our uh, uh, climate situation. So I urge rejection of the Stearns Amendment and applaud the committee and the staff for accommodating the concerns of the realtors in the base tax. Will the gentlelady yield, will the gentlelady yield, yield just for a second? Would the gentlelady yield? Gentle well, let me yield. yield to Mr. Stearns and then Mr. Markey. Um, I think the Matheson Amendment was applicable to Section 201, had nothing to do with 204, just to clarify. You, you're right, but it had to do with, with buildings, and so I, you're right. It doesn't have to do with Air, this specific. space, and material. Right. Yes. Okay. I thank the uh, gentlelady. Uh, buildings are responsible for 40 percent of greenhouse yeah. gas emissions. They, uh, 70 percent of uh, electricity in the United States is consumed uh, in buildings. Um, and this is a very good amendment. This is a voluntary program that we are talking yeah. about, a voluntary program which empowers states to adopt measures that will make building energy efficiency and building energy costs transparent. It provides education and incentives to support building energy transparency. But again, let me say this. I can't repeat it enough. This is a voluntary program that we are voting on. And uh, if a, a State does not want to participate, that is their choice. Yeah. But it is voluntary. And I thank the gentlelady yeah. for her leadership on it. Gentlelady, Re reclaim, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, just reclaiming my time for just a few seconds here. Um, there are prototype programs already in operation in the U.S. that have been peer reviewed and are supported by builders as well as state and federal governments. So it is clear that such a program can be accurate and effective in providing information. And there are established programs in Europe uh, that do what uh, the base text seeks to do. So I, I think we are making a big contribution. Uh, here and uh, I, consumers will thank us for it, and I don't think that realtors are uh, inconvenienced by this this opt-in so, program. Will the gentlelady yield for one more? Well, I have 30 seconds. I sure, I yield. It. I can use it. Um, when you go to page 276, and, and Mr. Mark and yourself have indicated it's voluntary, and it says the state may become eligible. Well, when the states look at this and they realize that they're going to get money and they are going to get Federal support, there are incentives for the States to adopt this because there is going to be a huge amount of direct Federal support, and this I am reading from the bill, for the program. Okay, I can't do it. And if the States comply, they are going to get this money, and there is going to be temptation by the States to get this money realizing they need it. Um, and yet when you go to look, and I say to the gentlelady, if you look at different you know, you have such a diverse geographical and climate region. You have single families versus multi families and commercial buildings versus single occupant commercial buildings. I think it's just a nightmare, and I'm afraid the states are going to not see this, and so I don't want to have them tempted because of federal subsidies for this program. Time has expired. Any further debate on this amendment? Gentleman from Georgia. Mr. Chairman, thank you. I, I certainly support uh, the gentleman from Florida's amendment. Uh, I haven't uh, completely read all of Section 204, but if what the information has been presented is accurate, it would seem to me that, that uh, if you had a labeling requirement uh, for residential and, and commercial, both the homes and, and buildings, it should be on new construction. Uh, and it should hold harmless uh, existing construction for the very reason that uh, Representative Stearns has outlined and for the very reason that uh, uh, the, the real estate uh, agents across this country uh, are opposed to, to this part of the bill. Uh, you can, with all due respect to the gentlewoman from uh, California, uh, you, I, I think we, uh, at our own peril, dismiss uh, the opinion uh, of the realtors in, in this situation. Uh, and, and I think that, uh, again, if going forward, 
uh, on new construction, it makes sense. But on existing, uh, you certainly can encourage, and when people are in the market to buy a commercial building or, or a home, generally they're going to have someone that's going to advise them about a, a lot of things about the building, uh, how the heating, uh, ventilation, air conditioning system works, and uh, uh, does it need a new roof, and is there uh, 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 any evidence of termites, uh, and also if the, if the building is energy efficient or not. Uh, and so I think we already have pretty well protected the consumer in that regard. Okay. And there are incentives that exist for uh, existing buildings to, to uh, get tax breaks for upgrading, whether it's windows or, 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 or what, uh, low, uh, low water flush toilets and things that, that uh, would incentivize people to, to be environmentally friendly and, and to do the right thing. But I mean, this labeling I think is dangerous. Uh, if you're, I, I will say to, to the majority, uh, if you feel that uh, a label is important, then why didn't we accept the, the uh, Blackburn Amendment yesterday, which would put a label on your utility bill uh, and tell consumers in the interest of transparency how much this new cap and trade in, in Title III uh, is causing them uh, to pay in regard to increased utility bills. So Gentlemen, you is not, not good for that, but it's, it's good for the other. It just doesn't make sense to me. Gentlemen, uh, yield. I'll be glad to yield. Well, this labeling is going to be very helpful for the consumers because they can do something about making their homes more energy efficient. And there's some information that would be valuable because they know they can save money if they uh, make changes uh, that may not even cost all that much. So I think uh, to strike this whole section doesn't really make sense. Uh, it's a voluntary one. Consumers could get useful information. And uh, I, I think people would want to know that information. Well, reclaiming my time, Mr. Chairman, I, with all due respect, I just simply disagree with you. And uh, I think we should strike the, the, the section. I think it's a, uh, it's a bad idea. Somebody just came up with a bad idea. They thought they had a good idea, but when you look at it, uh, as Mr. Stearns has and, and the realtors have, that the unintended consequences far outweigh any good. And for that reason, I fully support this amendment. And uh, with that... Mr. Chair, Mr. Uh, Mr. Gentleman from Georgia, would you yield the balance? Uh, I'll be happy to yield the balance of my time to the gentleman from Florida. Um, I just want to tell my colleagues, Mr. Markey says it's voluntary. Reading from the bill on page 280, there are an authorization of $50 million to the EPA administrator to implement this bill, and then the Secretary of Energy gets $20 million. So together, this program is a $70 million program. Now, I just, in a short amount of time, I want to ask counsel, when they talk about putting a label on every house in America with a star, can you describe to me what this star label looks like? Is it going to be the size of a fist? Is it going to be the size of a a tire. Uh, tell me a little bit about what this label would look like. Is it going to be so that you can see it from the road, can see it from the highway, or do you have to get up very close to see this uh, yeah. star energy label? This is, first, there's, there's nothing in this section that directly requires us to be an energy star label. This is um, a separate program from the energy star program. The design, contents, appearance, placement um, of the label is entirely up to the process that is set up for the EPA to study it, to look at how many different building types are. So we could have 50 states have 50 separate star labelings on the houses, whether it's a historical, commercial building, multifamily, single family. So EPA will establish this, but each state will have the right. Will the state decide on what this star label on your home looks like, or will it be each state? The way I think the program is intended to work is that EPA would design a prototype label, explain how it is to work, use DOE data on building type consumption to... Last question, Mr. Qu uh, Mr. Chairman, for the Council. Who decides where this label is it going to go on the front door, on the window, the back door, the chimney? Where is this label going to go? 
it's not in the statute, so that too would be up to administrative discretion and suggestions. Because it's a voluntary program, the, the states would certainly be able to but place the, the, the 70 million The gentleman's dollars. time has expired. In the opinion of the chair, we've had a very good debate on this amendment. I think members understand it. Let's proceed to the vote. All those in favor of the Stern Amendment say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. 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 In the opinion of the chair, the noes have it. Chairman, I ask a roll call vote. You want a roll call vote. Not Let's sure go to a roll call vote. I like to hear people's talk. Mr. Waxman. No. Mr. Waxman, no. Mr. Dingle. No. Mr. Dingle votes no. Mr. Markey. No. Mr. Markey, no. Mr. Boucher. Mr. Pallone. Mr. Gordon. Mr. Rush. Ms. Eshoo. Ms. Eshoo, no. Mr. Stupak. Mr. Engel. Mr. Engel votes no. Mr. Green. Ms. DeGette. Ms. DeGette, no. Mrs. Caps. No. Mrs. Caps votes no. Mr. Doyle. No. Mr. Doyle, no. Ms. Harmon. No. Ms. Harmon, no. Ms. Joukowsky. No. Ms. Joukowsky votes no. Mr. Gonzalez. No. Mr. Gonzalez votes no. Mr. Inslee. No. Mr. Inslee, no. Ms. Baldwin. No. Ms. Baldwin votes no. Mr. Ross. <coughs> Mr. Weiner. No. Mr. Weiner votes no. Mr. Matheson. Mr. Butterfield. No. Mr. Butterfield, no. Mr. Melanson. Yes. Mr. Melanson votes aye. Mr. Barrow. Aye. Mr. Barrow votes aye. Mr. Hill. Ms. Matsui. Ms. Matsui votes no. Mrs. Christensen. Mrs. Christensen votes no. Ms. Castor. Ms. Castor votes no. Mr. Sarbanes. Mr. Sarbanes votes no. Mr. Murphy of Connecticut. Mr. Space. Mr. Space passes. Mr. McNerney. Mr. McNerney, aye. Ms. Sutter. Ms. Sutter, aye. I'm sorry. <laughs> Ms. Sutton, aye. No. We're all falling asleep here. Mr. Braley. Mr. Welch. Mr. Barton. Ms. Barton votes aye. Mr. Hall. Mr. Upton. Aye. Mr. Upton, aye. Mr. Stearns. Mr. Stearns, aye. Mr. Deal. Aye. Mr. Deal, aye. Mr. Whitfield. Aye. Mr. Whitfield votes aye. Mr. Shimkus. Aye. Mr. Shimkus, aye. Mr. Shattuck. Aye. Mr. Shattuck votes aye. Mr. Blunt. Mr. Boyer. Mr. Boyer, aye. Mr. Radonovich. Mr. Radonovich, aye. Mr. Pitts. Mr. Pitts, aye. Ms. Bono Mack. Ms. Bono Mack, aye. Mr. Walden. Aye. Mr. Walden, aye. Mr. Terry. Aye. Mr. Terry, aye. Mr. Rogers. Aye. Mr. Rogers, aye. Mrs. Myrick. Aye. Mrs. Myrick, aye. Mr. Sullivan. Aye. Mr. Sullivan, aye. Mr. Murphy of Pennsylvania. Mr. Murphy, aye. Mr. Burgess. 
Mr. Burgess votes aye. Ms. Blackburn. Aye. Ms. Blackburn, aye. Mr. Gingry. Aye. Mr. Gingry, aye. Mr. Scalise. Aye. Mr. Scalise, aye. Mr. Hall. Aye. Mr. Hall votes aye. Mr. Mr. Boucher. Mr. Boucher votes no. Mr. Stupak. Mr. Stupak votes no. Mr. Pallone. Mr. Pallone votes no. Mr. Green. No. Mr. Green votes no. Mr. Mr. Ross. Mr. Ross votes aye. Mr. Mr. Rush. Mr. Rush votes no. Mr. Matheson. Mr. Matheson votes no. Of all members. No. Mr. Hill. Mr. Hill votes no. Mr. Gordon. Mr. Gordon votes no. Mr. Murphy, have you been vote recorded? Mr. Space votes no. I'm sorry, Mr. Murphy votes no. I'm going to change your vote. Okay, off and pass on. I'm sorry, he passed, that's right. All members responded to the call of the roll. Any member wish, any member on the Republican side wish to change her, his or her vote or the Democratic side? If not, let's tally the votes. On that vote, Mr. Chairman, the ayes were 27 and the nays were 29. 27 ayes, 29 noes, the amendment's not agreed to. Mr. McNerney. Thank you. Gentlemen. The gentleman thinks he has a different calculation. Well, I'll tell you what. We'll start on the next amendment and you go through and co coordinate it with the uh, staff and uh, we'll see if it's accurate. If it's not accurate, then we'll come back and address it. Mr. McNerney, you have an amendment to Title II? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to offer an end block amendment. This includes my amendment as well as amendments offered by Ms. Baldwin and Ms. Christensen. Without objection, the two amendments will be considered in block. Uh, the Reserve. Without objection, both amendments will Reserving be considered right as look, read, yeah. and the gentleman from California is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for recognizing me to offer this amendment, which promotes water efficiency, uh, reduce water use, and consequently reduce our nation's energy consumption. The amendment I offer today is based on H.R. 2368, the Water Advanced Technologies for Efficient Water Use Act of 2009, this legislation was recently introduced by Representative Holt of New Jersey and has also been championed by Representative Miller of California. I'd like to thank both of them for their leadership on this issue and note that they are strongly supportive of my efforts to amend this legislation. The original bill also in enjoys co-sponsors from both parties and a broad coalition of stakeholders. Although water use may seem to be um, distinctly a distinctly different challenge uh, from energy. The two issues are closely linked. Our country uses vast amounts of water uh, in, energy, in energy production, and it uses vast amounts of energy in producing drinking water, agricultural water, and water for other purposes. For instance, in 2005, a report prepared by the California Energy Commission 
concluded that California uses 19 percent of the state's electricity and 30 percent of its natural gas for water-related purposes. Climate change is impacting the water supply of California and elsewhere. Reduced snowpack in the Sierras has led to a diminished fresh water supply throughout the state and changing weather patterns across the nation pose serious threats for water use everywhere. Ener energy supply, climate change and water use are closely and inseparably linked. My amendment includes provisions that will reduce water use, lessen the strain on water infrastructure, con conserve energy used to pump, treat and transport water and encourage water conservation. Specifically, my amendment codifies the already existing water sense program within the Environmental Protection Agency. This program is tasked with promoting voluntary labeling of products, voluntary buildings, landscapes and services that are water efficient and high performing. Similar to the Energy Star program, the Water Sense program is meant to ensure that consumers have information about water efficiency of the products they purchase. Empowering consumers with this information will help all of our constituents save on the utility bills and facilitate the realization of the energy and environmental goals this committee is working to achieve. My, my amendment is a common sense, consumer friendly initiative to conserve water resources, which will help our country reduce energy use as well as adapt to, mitigate the effects of climate change. This in initiative has broad bipartisan support. Concerning the handout, the EPA just reviewed the bill and got back with a number of technical corrections which are written in, handwritten in on the bill. So this bill is about water conservation, uh, and efficient water use, water, water and energy are very closely related. So I encourage my colleagues to look at this bill uh, and support it uh, as a part of the uh, energy bill that we're considering. Mm -hmm. With that, I yield the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back his time or yields to another member? I'm going to yield back, Mr. Chairman. I think okay. uh, that Ms. Christian wants to strike the last word. Uh, gentlelady from Virgin Islands, recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, uh, my amendment again aims to address the unique circumstances of the United States territories, which are island communities and island economies, by adding a subtitle G to um, Title I. If the current energy infrastructure and energy development in the territories are not specifically addressed in this bill, again, in this instance, my colleagues and I from the territories fear the underlying goals and principles of this bill will not be realized in our islands. Furthermore, the inability to attain standards contained within this bill by the territories would have a lasting negative impact on our island economies. We do not need to further the disparity in economic and energy advancement between the territories and the U.S. mainland. Instead, we should be continuing to work to reduce this disparity by providing the territories with the tools and resources needed to improve energy efficiency and to work towards greater energy independence. Mm -hmm. My amendment at its core adopts a pragmatic approach to finding a workable energy solution for our territories. This amendment is about providing our territories with the assistance to meet the standards this bill promises. This amendment would instruct the Secretary of Energy to establish an island energy independence team whose mission would be to work with local leadership to develop energy action plans for each of the territories. This team would consist of technical policy and financial experts that would examine the unique energy needs of each territory. The energy action plans for each territory called for by this amendment would take into account the long-term sustainability of territorial energy production and use and its intimate connection with the environment and economy of our islands. My amendment recognizes that as islands, the territories are well suited with opportunities to develop renewable and environmentally friendly energy resources, but at the same time face difficult technical and financial challenges to develop these resources. The team would seek to identify strategies to reduce 
the reliance and expenditures on foss imported fossil fuels, improve the energy efficiency of power generation, transmission and distribution, and increase consumer energy efficiency. The team would also seek to improve the performance of energy infrastructure of each territory through enhanced planning, education, and training. The resulting custom-made energy action plans that my amendment would implement would allow for the goals and visions set forth in this bill to be achieved in the territories. And I want to recognize the work of Congresswoman Bordalio of Guam and Congressman Perlusi of Puerto Rico for their work on this amendment, and I urge its adoption. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Gen Generally yields back her time. Further discussion on these unblock amendments? Yeah, Mr. Chairman, I could I be recognized oh. to write the last word on my uh, amendment? Ge Generally is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The amendment that I'm offering is a result of collaborative discussions involving the NRDC, the World's Resources Institute, EPA, and the Carbon Trust, and leading academics. It is aimed at addressing greenhouse gas emissions through consumer behavior in particular by measuring and disclosing the amount of greenhouse gas emissions that go into the making and use of a product. By getting this information, consumers can make informed choices about what they purchase. This would be an entirely voluntary program. I want to emphasize that point, entirely voluntary. A carbon label can be a sort of nutrition label for the environment. It allows consumers to be armed with the information they need to make a difference. Just as food labeling has changed the way we um, think about what we eat, a carbon label for consumer goods, including industrial products, food items, and household cleaners, will provide us with information about the energy and environmental impact of products we buy. And not only can individual behavior be influenced, but product uh, carbon disclosure and labeling provides a unique way of addressing some of the international competitiveness issues that we've been talking about and influ influencing producers in China and India to monitor their emissions output. Recognizing that there are many questions about how best to measure life cycle greenhouse gas emissions, this amendment requires as a precursor to a program uh, the EPA to first conduct a study into the feasibility of establishing a national program for measuring, reporting, and labeling products or materials um, in the U.S. for their carbon content. Further, upon conclusion of the study, the EPA is required to set up a national product carbon disclosure program which may involve a product label. Participation, as I stressed before, would be voluntary. The product carbon disclosure and labeling concept is not at all new. The Carbon Trust in the UK has taken a lead in establishing international standards for carbon measurement. Many familiar companies are already partnering with the Carbon Trust, including Tropicana Orange Juice, a PepsiCo product, Walker's brand potato chips, Huggies, and Cadbury chocolates. J Japan, too, is carrying out carbon footprint labels on food packaging and other products. Consumers of Sapporo Black Label Beer will be told how much CO2 is emitted by the machinery used to plant barley and hops and during production and transportation and up until the empty can is recycled. Further, the California legislature, legislature is currently considering a voluntarily a carbon label bill. I just want to show, this is an example of um, uh, Walker's uh, chips. Um, uh, not only do they have the nutrition labeling that we're so familiar with uh, here in this country, but on this uh, side we have a, their CO2 label and it uh, describes how much uh, CO2 was emitted, everything from uh, planting the potatoes and the sunflowers that produce the sunflower oil all the way uh, till it uh, um, can be purchased. Um, and I want to mention not only does this help drive consumer choices, but it does also inform manufacturers and producers so they can better understand where they can limit their um, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. As in Walker's example, they learned to their surprise that transportation was actually a minor factor, but some of the uh, practices used in the planting of, uh, of potatoes uh, extracted a higher carbon uh, impact, and they were able to take corrective action in, in reduce their own carbon footprint uh, in the production of these products by 10 percent just by understanding it better. So I would urge my colleagues to support this amendment and yield back my remaining time. Yeah. Yeah. Or I can ask. Mr. Chairman, 
Uh, Mr. Barton. I seek recognition. Uh, just strike the record. Gentleman is recognized for five. Um, I, I feel a little bit like Mr. Chairman. I've gone to a church bazaar and bought the mystery package, not knowing what's in it. Um, Congratulations. Yeah, we don't. <laughs> well, what's in it are three disparate amendments uh, that have no relevance to each other, other than that they're all amendments to the same bill, uh, and even apparently the same title. Um, one of them, um, the the gentlelady from the Virgin Islands um, appears to uh, uh, correct some discrepancies in the territories, and that would appear to be something that's worth doing. Then our friend from California has offered a, uh, a water rebate program that starts at $50 million a year and escalates to $150 million a year. Uh, that would, in some some sectors be a huge bill and a major debate all of its own dealing with water and water rebates and it's just one of the three and then our good friend from wisconsin has got a voluntary carbon labeling program which is mandated that it be studied and if i understood her correctly mandated that they make a decision whether to make make it voluntary that people comply with it and my, my question on the carbon, if we knew the carbon content, what would we know? We would, what information does that give us? So, Mr. Chairman, I'm going to ask for a division um, to divide the Christensen Amendment and accept it or let you have a separate, have a separate vote and then uh, have a roll call vote on the, in, the divided in block amendments of Mr. McNerney and Ms. Baldwin. Uh, let's proceed first uh, to vote on the Christensen Amendment. All those in favor of the Christensen Amendment will say aye. 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 Opposed, no. The ayes have it. The vote now comes on the other three. Two. 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 The other two unblock amendments. Mr. And Chairman. we'll proceed be, to a roll call. Mr. Chairman, vote. there may be six recognition. <laughs> yes. Uh, just to bring up the point that. We are we're going to label homes. We want to label carbon in potato chips, but we don't want to label the climate effect on energy bills. Okay, that's what we're saying, right? We had the chance to oh, we, we had a chance to amend the bill last night to say let's put in in the energy bills of ratepayers what the increase to their electricity cost would be on climate. And the Republicans voted, yes, labeling's good. Democrats voted, no, let's don't label. But now we voted to label homes. We now want to label potato chips. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm concerned about the nutrition labeling for the rate payer. I'm concerned about the nutrition labeling for the taxpayer. When is the taxpayer going to know the cost of the increase of this bill on their electricity rates? And I would think that maybe through this process, Mr. Chairman, we could work to an agreement, if we're going to be labeling everything, that we would come to some agreement to label the electricity bill so that the rate payer knows how much of this escalated cost will be about this legislation. And that's why, uh, uh, that's why I, I feel so strongly to speak out against labeling potato chips when we won't label electricity bills, and I yield back my time. Like all the rest of us. Is we'll now proceed to a vote on the other two amendments in block. Uh, Mr. Barton indicated he wanted a roll call vote. We'll proceed to a roll call vote. Right, let's think about that. Mr. Waxman. Aye. Mr. Waxman, aye. Mr. Dingle. Aye. Mr. Dingle, aye. Mr. Markey. Aye. Mr. Markey, aye. Mr. Boucher. Mr. Pallone. Mr. Gordon. Mr. Rush. 
Ms. Eshoo. Ms. Eshoo. Ms. Eshoo, aye. Mr. Stupak. Mr. Stupak, aye. Mr. Engel. Mr. Green. Ms. DeGett. Ms. DeGett votes aye. Mrs. Caps. Mrs. Caps, aye. Mr. Doyle. Mr. Doyle, aye. Ms. Harmon. Aye. Ms. Harmon, aye. Ms. Joukowsky. Mr. Gonzalez. Aye. Mr. Gonzalez votes aye. Mr. Inslee. Aye. Mr. Inslee, aye. Ms. Baldwin. Aye. Ms. Baldwin votes aye. Mr. Ross. Mr. Weiner. Mr. Weiner, aye. Mr. Matheson. Mr. Matheson, aye. Mr. Butterfield. Mr. Butterfield votes aye. Mr. Malison. Mr. Barrow. Mr. Barrow votes aye. Mr. Hill. Aye. Mr. Hill, aye. Ms. Matsui. Aye. Ms. Matsui, aye. Mrs. Christensen. Mrs. Christensen, aye. Ms. Castor. Ms. Castor votes aye. Mr. Sarbanes. Mr. Murphy of Connecticut. Mr. Murphy of Connecticut, aye. Mr. Space. Mr. McNerney. Mr. McNerney, aye. Ms. Sutton. Ms. Sutton, aye. Mr. Braley. Mr. Welch. Mr. Welch, aye. Mr. Barton. Mr. Barton votes no. Mr. Hall. Mr. Hall, no. Mr. Upton. Mr. Upton, no. Mr. Stearns. Mr. Stearns, no. Mr. Deal. Mr. Deal, no. Mr. Whitfield. Mr. Whitfield, no. Mr. Shimkus. No. Mr. Shimkus, no. Mr. Shattuck. No. Mr. Shattuck votes no. Mr. Blunt. <coughs> Mr. Boyer. No. Mr. Boyer votes no. Mr. Radonovich. No. Mr. Radonovich votes no. Mr. Pitts. No. Mr. Pitts, no. Ms. Bonomack. No. Ms. Bonomack votes no. Mr. Walden. No. Mr. Walden, no. Mr. Terry. No. Mr. Terry, no. Mr. Rogers. No. Mr. Rogers, no. Mrs. Myrick. Mr. Sullivan. Mr. Sullivan votes no. Mr. Murphy of Pennsylvania. Mr. Murphy votes no. Mr. Burgess. No. Mr. Burgess votes no. Ms. Blackburn. Ms. Blackburn votes no. Mr. Gingry. No. Mr. Gingry votes no. Mr. Scalise. No. Mr. Scalise votes no. Mr. Boucher. Mr. Boucher votes aye. Mr. Pallone. I'm sorry. Mr. Gordon. Mr. Gordon. Aye. Mr. Green. Aye. Mr. Green, aye. Mr. Rush. Aye. Mr. Rush, aye. Mr. Melanson. Aye. Mr. Melanson, aye. Ms. Schakowsky. Aye. Ms. Schakowsky votes aye. Mr. Engel. Aye. Mr. Engel, aye. Mr. Sarbanes. 
Mr. Sarbanes votes aye. <laughs> Mr. Ross. Yes. Mr. Ross, aye. No. Anybody else? I'm sorry. Mr. Space, I'm sorry. Mr. Space, aye. Elliot, you got to count. <laughs> Have all members responded to the call of the roll? The clerk will tally the vote. On that vote, Mr. Chairman, the yeas were 34, the nays were 21. 34 ayes, 21 noes. The amendments are agreed to. Uh, we now recognize Member Mr. Sullivan. Yes, Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment. Amendment. At Do you the seek a recognition to offer an amendment. Is it to Title II? Yes, sir. And uh, the clerk will tell us whether it has been sitting around long enough. Yeah, I hope so. Like Friday, Saturday. Amendment offered by Mr. Sullivan of Oklahoma. Without objection, the amendment will be considered as read. Gentlemen, is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this amendment uh, adds the use of tra uh, transit buses that are powered by alternative fuels, including natural gas, to a substitute amendment. You know, as we look at have this energy debate, uh, considering a, a, a huge energy proposal here today and uh, yesterday and tomorrow, that uh, we need to look at all types of energy uh, and all of the above strategy. It's very important, and right now we need to make sure we don't shoot the horse that we're on until we get a horse to get on. And one of the things we need to do as we do that is uh, focus on using natural gas as a bridge fuel till we determine how we can get through a lot of this. It burns clean. We have a 120-year reserve of, of natural gas in this country, and we're not utilizing it the way we should. Uh, you know, we use 21 million barrels of oil a day, roughly, give or take, and 69% of that 21 million barrels of oil uh, is used for transportation fuel. So one of the things we need to do is focus on the vehicles, uh, getting more natural gas vehicles, having an infrastructure in place to distribute that natural gas. We do have a, a pipeline infrastructure in place, 1.5 million miles of pipeline in place. We don't have, you know, the gas stations don't have it all, but we need to have incentives for that. Um, in Europe and Asia and other countries around the world, they have roughly 10 million natural gas vehicles that they use. Here in the United States, we have 110,000 natural gas vehicles. Um, if you look at the gas equivalent, it's a no-brainer that we do this. If we're looking at uh, you know, addressing uh, greenhouse gas emissions, natural gas is something we certainly need to look at as a bridge fuel until we get the technologies in place so we can use all these different kinds of fuels and that we can have these uh, standards in place, uh, renewable standards in place. And I move uh, adoption of the bill. Would the gentleman yield? Our amendment. Yes. Yes. I I'm wondering if I could could ask the gentleman because I'm a little bit bit confused as to what what this actually does. Is this um, is this is the gentleman proposing to use um, alternative uh, fuels for transit buses? Is that essentially natural gas you mentioned? Yeah, it's may, may alternative fuels, but natural gas. Getting the conversions using natural gas. We do use it in a lot of fleets right now. A lot of buses. Uh, that's really something we need to capitalize m on more. Uh, I was talking about cars and stuff, but this does address mainly fleets, buses, uh, buses. Well, I, I would say to the gentleman that um, I, I'd like to, to know, um, you know more about his amendment, but I, I think that this country uh, should be moving uh, towards alternative fuels, whether it's natural gas or whether it's um, ethanol or methanol. I think that we are we are crazy if we if we don't uh, um, try to end the stranglehold that a uh, big uh, oil uh, uh, has on us. Uh, if we don't wean ourselves uh, off of uh, foreign oil, um, it's not going to be very good for this country. And, and again, while I, I support uh, the, the thrust of, of what the bill does, um, I think uh, any more emphasis that we could have uh, on alternative fuels as a transition uh, till we uh, are finally uh, energy independent, um, I think is uh, is a good thing. And if the gentleman is um, uh, just uh, saying that um, 
um, he is for more alternative fuels, then I, then I think the gentleman is, is moving in the right direction. Now, thank, thank you. you. Would the gentleman yield? Yes, sir. Um, I thank the gentleman. I thank the gentleman for his uh, amendment. I think it is a, a good amendment, and I think it points us uh, in the right direction, and that means towards the future. And, uh, and I thank the gentleman for his uh, uh, work. Would that mean you are going to accept it? Are you going to accept it? Instead of thanking us for pointing us in the right that way, but Sounded that way to me? Yeah, it's a, it's a good amendment. And, uh, good amendment, good author. Right, right. And we good bill. Yes, sir. Well, we <laughs> well, don't go that far. <laughs> you just lost your next election. And, well, and also, since you're in this good mood, uh, I do have four amendments I would like to submit and block on the, on the first title later on, if I can, get those assurances. <laughs> And that deals with the same type of issue on natural gas vehicles. Good. We'll focusing on. Look forward to reviewing it. Would the gentleman yield? Uh, yes. Just just ask questions since uh, I know natural gas is a, is a big issue in in uh, Oklahoma. What is the effect of uh, changing the depletion allowance and the tax code proposed would do to exploration of natural gas? Well, that is a good qu question. Uh, the proposal to get rid of the depletion allowance and intangible drilling costs is 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 very detrimental to. The uh, independent producers that are in my state and around the country, the kind of the backbone of our industry, not big oil or big gas or anything like that, um, you know, they don't have their market market uh, takers, not market makers. So if they don't have anybody to pass it on to. So in essence, if that was taken away from these uh, independent producers, it would mean, you know, it would be catastrophic to their business. I think the, uh, the proposal will generate about $31 billion dollars. Uh, to use that for other purposes, and uh, I think that's something we should not do. We need to keep those in place. It's very important, and it'd be uh, very detrimental to the industry because there is no one to pass it. Would to. the gentleman yield? Yes, sir. I think the majority is going to accept your amendment if we stop talking about it. Okay. <laughs> I'm all for that. Are we ready for the question? All those in favor of the amendment say aye. 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 Opposed, no. The ayes have it, and the amendment's agreed to. Mr. Welch. Mr. Welch, are you seeking recognition, or is that a, just a false rumor? <laughs> no, the, I am seeking recognition. The gentleman is seeking recognition for the purpose of offering an amendment? Uh, that's correct. I have an amendment. To, to this uh, title. Clerk will report the amendment. <laughs> amendment offered by Mr. Welch of Vermont and Mr. Inslee of Washington and Ms. Harmon of California. At the end of subtitle B of Title II, add the following. Section 215. Without objection, the amendment, Stubbs program. the amendment will be considered as read. And uh, Chair, recognize Mr. Welch. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. This amendment offered by Mr. Ensley and uh, Ms. Harmon uh, is about wood stoves. And it is based upon uh, the two things. One, uh, many states, including Vermont, uh, folks use wood stoves to provide efficient uh, heat. Uh, but they, the old stoves uh, do cause some significant uh, discharge of carbon uh, emissions. And this is about establishing a certified stove program with the goal of reducing particulate emission. The specifics in this is that it would apply to wood stoves, pellet stoves, or a fireplace insert that use wood or pellets for fuel, which meet EPA standards of performance for new residential wood heaters. Uh, the EPA administrator was, is directed under this amendment to create a program to replace wood stoves that don't meet, meet the standards of performance. Many of the older stoves uh, didn't have catalytic converters and uh, uh, updated technological devices that help reduce the emissions. Uh, funding would be used towards installation of a replacement certified stove and necessary replacement of or repairs to relevant items necessary for sa uh, uh, safe insul installation. Uh, $20 million it would be uh, available for fiscal years 2010 through 2014 and 72 percent would be designated for use to carry out the program under this section nationwide. Uh, 25 percent would be designated for use to carry out the program under this section on lands held in trust uh, for the benefit of federally recognized Indian tribes. 
and 3 percent would be designated for use to carry out the program under this section in Alaska Native Villages or regional or village incorporations. Uh, I yield back. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Who seeks recognition? I, I do. <coughs> the gentleman from Oregon is recognized. I, I can't resist because I haven't talked about woody biomass in the last few hours. But once again, uh, my part of the world, we have a lot of this that would be converted into something called pellets, which are referenced in these stoves. Um, that's what we're trying to fix in the bill so that the material that comes off these forests can be converted into pellets and that that generation of energy uh, would be considered renewable. And I guess that's a frustration I'm going to continue to express until we get it right here, that the underlying bill treats pellets from forest lands, from mature forests that are dead, dying, beetle infested, whatever, as non-renewable. And I don't get why there's that distinction when the same wood off private land is treated as renewable. And uh, so I just put that on the record. Hopefully we'll be able to go back to Title I of this bill, get one more crack at the mature forest line, because I think uh, people have figured out I was right yesterday. And uh, we can correct this problem. So uh, I yield back. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Barton. I seek recognition to strike the requisite number of words. Mr. Chairman, I want to ask the author of the amendment some questions before I make a decision on the um, amendment. Um, I would assume that many people in, in Vermont and New Hampshire heat their homes with these stoves that are their primary source of heat. Is that correct? Uh, I'm among them. You're among them. Do you, do you have an idea of what percentage of the population this is the primary heating source? Uh, I actually, I don't. Uh, it's, it's a minority. Uh, Vermont actually is one of the states, I think, with probably the higher, uh, highest percentage of, of folks who use this either as primary or most often, as I do, as supplemental. Okay, I'm, 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 I'm confused. Most people in Vermont use this as their primary heating source or no. m most people use it as a okay. supplemental heating source? Well, probably, strictly speaking, most people don't use it. Oh, don't use it at all. The, the, the highest percentage, I believe, of folks who use wood stoves is in Vermont. We have a lot of people who use it, but it's, the, it's still the primary a heat for us is oil, hot water. Okay. M Mr. Chairman, or, or Rankin, would you yield to me? Be happy to. Um, just real quickly, the uh, hospital in Harney County just converted last year to a pellet burning heating system. They uh, reduced their energy costs, I want to say, by two-thirds. Right. At the same time, they dramatically increased the size of the hospital. Our Department of Environmental Quality said that the emissions are so minor from this that, that they're hardly even, they can't even detect them. Um, they're using a pellet heating system. I think they got out of Sweden. Provides all their hot water, all their heat. They were petroleum-based. Um, and so it, it's replaced all of that. And they take out a garbage can, standard residential garbage can load of ash every two to three months. That's the residual, which then they put in gardens, and it's a soil emulsifier. And, uh, and so they reduce their emissions. They're not using petroleum. They cut their cost by two-thirds. This is a wonderful technology that uh, and, and, and I think we should encourage. And we have a lot of, I have a well, lot of constituents I, 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 that I appreciate you saying that. You know, we've had some schools, I'm sure the same is true for you. Yes. Property taxes are just a wicked yeah. burden. They're trying to figure out ways to cut down on the cost. And a number of, uh, we have a clean energy fund in Vermont, and schools can apply for grants, and they put in these wood chip or biomass uh, systems. And, and you know what's interesting is the students have played a major role in this. You know, getting involved right. not just in the idea, but the actual implementation, and they've had to deal with practical problems. We but the new technologies, like you say, they're, they're clean as well as, uh, as, well as uh, using the biomass and wood well, and, and, and we're working off the ranking member's time I'm here. I'll be, I'll be brief. But I have a school that did the same thing, went to hog fuel. It's, it's wood chips. 
and dramatically reduce their oil use to heat their school. The, the, the trouble is they, the only chips they could get, they have to truck in from like f probably 60 miles away off private forest land. They're surrounded by federal forest land. <laughs> I mean, this that, that needs treatment, and that's why I'm saying there are some excellent things we could do to stop using petroleum, start using wood that would be efficient, and better for the environment, and reduce fires. Well, Mr. Ch uh, reclaiming my time, I am of a mixed opinion about this. I'm a strong supporter of the technology. Former Congressman Charlie Bass of New Hampshire is a big advocate of wood pellet stoves, but. A, Apparently, this is not a primary heating source for many people. It's more of a secondary heating source. And I've, I've tried to carefully read the amendment. Mercifully, it's written in language that normal people can understand. So I want to compliment you on that, that it's not too, uh, too technical. As I understand it, you want to um, create a program that all stoves, all wooden, all wood stoves sold have to meet certain performance requirements, but you also want to set up a program that if a stove doesn't meet that performance requirement, um, you can apply to the EPA for funding to replace it. Uh, and you've authorized $20 million, if I understand it correctly, for such replacement program. You also have a provision that sets up some um, mandatory emission reductions programs, but they're not to be considered mandated. So I'm, I'm going to mildly oppose it. Um, I think it's a little bit of overkill, um, but I'm certainly not opposed to wood pellet stoves. So I'm going to oppose the amendment. Are we ready for the uh, question? Mr. Chairman, just a, qu a quick question. Yes, on, uh, to the, the author of the um, amendment no. on page 6 on certification, in any settlement agreement regarding an alleged violation of environmental law, uh, would, would you, is there a definition of specific aspects of law or just any environmental law? Uh, it's, it says any environmental law and that's what it is, yeah. the laws that are currently on the books. Yeah. Mr. Chairman? And, more, and, and I would say it, normally we would be in reference to the Clean Air Act. Is, is that the author's um, view that this is in response to environmental law with respect to the Clean Air Act? Well, I, yes. I, the issue that we have. I mean, there's a lot of envir environmental laws out there. Right. No, it, this is all about trying to get cleaner stoves. It's, it's kind of like cash for clunkers. You know, there's a lot of folks, uh, by the way, I found out it's 30 to 50 percent of Vermonters have uh, wood stoves, uh, some secondary, some primary. Uh, some have old wood stoves, and this would be to encourage them to get the kind of clean burning uh, facilities that uh, Mr. Walden was referencing. Okay. Yeah, and I, and I appreciate that. I just wanted to make sure there was clarification. This is in reference, your intent is the Clean Air Act, the environmental laws with respect to emissions, not any other environmental laws. Uh, that, that is my intention, Mr. Shimkus. You back, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Time has expired. Ms. Harmon. Yeah, I am uh, proud to uh, co-sponsor this amendment. And I've just checked again uh, with staff. And my understanding, I'd like Mr. Walsh to correct me if I'm wrong, is that it is not a mandatory program, it's a voluntary program. That's and correct. What it, what That's it's, correct. Am I correct? You are correct. And so I, I just would hope that yeah. Mr. Barton might reconsider his okay. soft opposition. Why I like this is, uh, as he says, it's an interesting technology. It is used in regions of the country. For example, in Northern California, in some, in some regions of my state, uh, I know uh, my own brother has a uh, wood-burning stove, and, and there can be good ones and not good ones, and the technology matters. And it also resembles other features of this bill that most of us like, the sort of cash-for-clunkers approach. The idea is to push the technology to come up with something that's good and then to encourage people through a system of incentives to get rid of their clunkers. Yeah, I, I know. And so I, uh, I applaud Mr. Welsh. I'm glad he wrote an amendment in English. And I just hope that uh, Mr. Barton's reviewing the fact that it's a voluntary program and maybe he will decide he can accept it. Chairman Yield, General Lady Yield. 
Yes, I yield to Mr. Very, very briefly, two points. Uh, I just want to make sure Mr. Barton realized there are tons of folks who use this, at least in the West, uh, as a primary heating source. This is it, particularly in rural areas. Uh, there's 9 million of these stoves out there that are quite old and inefficient. Now they're making these stoves that are 30, 40, 50, 60 percent more efficient. So this is a really step forward. It's just not a marginal improvement. Second point I want to make is it isn't just the Clean Air Act that is at stake here. Stoves do emit black carbon, soot, and soot has been sort of a new culprit in global climate change because when it drifts north and lands in the snow, it absorbs heat and melt snow, and it's one of the culprits in the Arctic problem. So there's a couple good reasons to do this. Thank you. Well, it, a gentleman yield, then we need to find a clarification from the, oh, I'm sorry, for the gentlelady. If it, yes. what, I, then I need to know what this environmental law is. The author of the amendment said it, re, it re, replies to the Clean Air Act. Well, let me, uh, if you don't mind, do uh, ask Mr. Welsh to reply to you. Well, the, the answer to that is yes, uh, but also the laws are the laws. Whatever laws are on the books, all, all of us have an obligation, obviously, to be in compliance with. But this is all about uh, clean air. <laughs> well, I missed something. Did I, I heard somebody offer to change the amendment to make it voluntary? So what? No. What? Um, reclaiming my time, I believe it is voluntary, Mr. Barton. We're trying. To, I'm trying to get that point corrected by the bill's sponsor. Or that 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 it's not corrected, but I'm trying to uh, get the bill sponsored to to take you through the amendment and and show you that it's a voluntary amendment. Yield, yield to Mr. Welsh. Uh, thank you. Just to clarify a little further for Mr. Shimkus and uh, his good question, his good question. What that section is really about is giving the EPA authority uh, to allow. Uh, someone who's found to have been in violation uh, of some environmental law, uh, pollution, uh, at, for, for pollution, minutes, uh, to essentially avoid a fine uh, by installing the proper equipment. So it's, a, it's, a, it's an incentive and actually some help uh, to provide that person or that entity with a clean stove. Uh, and that's a win-win. That's a uh, folks who have stoves like them, uh, having a cleaner burning stove is more efficient uh, and obviously better for the environment. So that's the, that's the goal, Mr. Shimkus. I think they'd be fine with it. But if you may want to ask some questions, too. Yeah. So <laughs> what the, what, who has the time? Um, I had the time. Okay. Well, I on, on page two at the, at the bottom of the page on line 20 under the heading establishment, it says the administrator shall establish and carry out a program. Yeah. Shall. That's not yeah. may. Mr. Barton, it says to assist in the replacement of wood stoves, etc. It doesn't say that uh, one has to replace a wood stove. It's creating an option <laughs> which is going to drive the technology just the way the Cash for Clunkers program drives the technology and encourages consumers uh, to use more energy efficient appliances, in this case stoves. All right, it just says shall. Uh, the chair would like to know the status of the amendment. No, the, Ms. Harmon's time has expired. The chair would inquire has the amendment been perfected? Are we ready for the question on the amendment? All those in favor of the amendment say aye. Well, let's do it this way, show of hands. All those in favor of the amendment, please hold up your hands, and the clerk will count the vote. Anna, put your hand, yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, I don't want to be, I want to beat up this stuff. Yeah, all those opposed to the amendment, please raise your hand.
clerk uh, will inform us of the tally of the uh, show Mr. of hands. Chairman, that, the, that show of hands, the division vote was 25 ayes and 4 noes. 25 ayes and 4 noes, the amendments agreed to. Uh, 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 Mr. Chairman, parliamentary inquiry. Who's, that, who's seeking it? Yes. Uh, 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 first of all, uh, the question is, was this amendment perfected in the legislative process? Is this a parliamentary inquiry? Yeah. I, I'm not a lawyer, but uh, it is an inquiry to the parliamentary procedures of the committee of whether you had asked, asked if there was, if the amendment has been perfected. My question is, did we perfect it? Yield to me. I would. I wasn't following the debate that closely. It okay. sounded like there was some question of confusion as to what was, yeah. whether they needed, a, somebody wanted a change in it or not, or whether it was voluntary or not voluntary. And so I thought that maybe perhaps there was a suggestion of language, but it seems to me that there was a meeting of the minds for those who were listening. Yeah, and, and as you know, I, I was following it uh, fairly close. My, 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 my question is, in this process of the, the environmental law, if someone is uh, against f federal law on a super fund, would installing wood stoves be uh, the words not words not the proper words not mitigation but part if, of the if process. the government would permit if uh, compliance could any any yeah, Mr. federal Mr. Welch would you listen to his question because I'd like you to respond to it and then we're going to move on I, I'm listening I'll, tr I'll I'll even try to understand it that's well, more, you know, the more than fund. the chair wants to do. This, the Superfund Act, which is uh, it, bad stuff in the ground, we've all dealt with it. Any environmental law is as part of this amendment, so some of the, the you could comply with mitigation of the Superfund environmental law by the wood stove purchasing rebate fund. Well, you know the way it works with laws is they're supposed to be reasonably read, and let's say there's an Exxon Valdez uh, spill off Alaska, uh, they're not going to be able to mitigate that by putting in a wood stove somewhere. Uh, this really relates to the actor, the person with the stove, and the impact of the use of that stove, perhaps the cause of uh, this, uh, pollution uh, as a result of it being inefficient. So my understanding of this, and it was intended to be drafted this way, Mr. Shimkus, is that this is all about uh, the Clean Air Act where there may be a violation of clean air regulations and a person who is the quote violator is given the opportunity to mitigate rather than to pay a fine. Uh, but if, if gentlemen yield, but that's the problem. We, you're now using the Clean Air Act and we've already decided that it's all environmental law. That's, that's the whole problem with the amendment is trying to get definition. And I, Mr. Chairman, this is a, there's a lot of bigger fish to fry. I'm not, I, I'd like to move on, but I, I think I would like, and that's as this process move forward, that on this issue it'd be we would clarify it because it's not clear. Because every time we try to debate what this means, we use a different terminology for environmental law, and I and I yield back my time. Uh, gentleman yields back the balance of the time, and uh, there'll be further discussions as uh, this bill moves on on this issue so members can make sure they uh, f feel comfortable with it. But a majority did feel comfortable to vote for it and it's adopted. Um, Mr. Radanovich, I understand you have some amendments in block you wish to offer. I want to recognize you at this time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have uh, three amendments, <coughs> excuse me, at the desk labeled uh, Shadig 71 BC and D, and I would ask unanimous consent that the amend all in Three amendments be considered as read. Without objection, without objection, these three amendments will be considered as read, and uh, we'll now proceed to uh, yield the gentleman five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Talk in this amendment. Appreciate that, Mr. Chairman. In my time in Congress, I've admired many states who seem to come together and unify over various issues, and you know, as in California, we have 53 members. It's a diverse state. I love the state, but sometimes it's hard to come together on things, and 
And I asked a, a friend from another state, I said, how do you do it? How do you come together? And he said, we use California as an example of how not to be. And um, the reason why I meant that, it's in that spirit that I offer these three amendments, because, because they, they speak to different um, efficiency mandates that were lifted from the California Efficiency Standard Code as it relates to electric spas, mandates for water dispensers, and mandates for food holding cabinets. Um, and the amendments uh, that, I, that I offer would strike the efficiency standards and the mandates for all three of these items. I do have a question of counsel. If I may, I'd like to ask how many spas would currently meet this requirement or would be affected by this requirement? Can you tell me in the United States? I don't have that information. It, and thank you, Council. I appreciate that. But if you don't have the information, then why are we implementing the standard? Don't, don't, wouldn't it be wise before we implemented a standard like this that we'd know, you know, the 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 impact on CO2 output? I do have information of calculation of how much energy would, and CO2 output would be saved on on spas and. Uh, water dispensers and holding and food holding cabinets yes uh, this is this is an estimate that was created by the uh, um, I believe by the industries involved and by the American Council for an energy efficient economy so that it's not a committee number but uh, there is information in the record. It's a, and I'm sorry uh, who were the ones that provided the information was it uh, the Manufacturers involved, apparently, and the American Council for an Energy Efficient Economy. And who's the American Council for Energy Efficiency Economy? Economy. That's a nonprofit energy efficiency group that was one of the groups that was involved in negotiating and agreeing to the consensus standards that are in this section, along with the manufacturers who make these products. Do you know who they're funded by or have any idea who, who that group is funded by? or headed up by? I, I don't know their funding sources. The reason why I'm offering these amendments, uh, Mr. Chairman, is that, um, again, California is not, not, the first, not the state to be modeling yourself after. As you know, yesterday there have been some budget initiatives that was ever result, have failed, and uh, the state is now $42 billion in, uh, in debt. And uh, I think and it's in a large part because California has become a nanny state in that they're trying to do too many things to too many people in the state global warming bill is trying to to do too many things for everybody on the planet just by itself and the result has been large increase in cost to consumers and businesses in california for the first time we've got more people leaving california than are entering california and we've got more business leaving california because of the unfavorable business climate these are examples and nitpicking small examples of, of why things are so tough in California and why an onerous global warming uh, initiative, if you apply nationally what's been done in California, you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna experience the same problems we are in balancing the budget and running out of money. And um, so uh, it, it's in that spirit that I offer these three amendments and uh, um, the gentleman yield back. I yield to the gentleman from Arizona. Okay. I thank the gentleman for yielding. Uh, I rise in support of the amendments, uh, but I would like to ask counsel, um, there is a similar provision in the bill that uh, sets standards for art lighting, uh, that is, lighting placed on art objects in residences. Is, do you have an estimate of how much energy is consumed? Uh, I, I believe you just disclosed you do have for some. Do you happen to have one for art lighting consumed in residences? The table that I have has an estimate for the portable lighting consensus agreement within which the art lighting part is a, is a part, but I don't have a separate estimate. Did you say lighting. portable lighting? Portable lighting. Yeah, well, I'm not interested in portable lighting. I assume art lighting is fixed to the art object or to shine on the art, art object, but you're saying art lighting is, is within that category? If you can move the art object, I guess you move the light as well. Yeah, Rick, Rick, Clint. Thank you. Gentlemen, time, time I don't have. I, I yield back. 
gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes himself. Uh, these sections enact that uh, new standards for a variety of appliances, including outdoor lights, which will save immense amounts of energy. There are also several crucial improvements to the appliance standard setting process that will enhance the process. Appliance standards are one of the most effective energy efficiency policies. The standards already on the books will save over $400 billion by 2030, according to the American Council for an Energy Efficient Economy. The new standards in the bill will cut emissions by almost 12 million metric tons of carbon dioxide per year by 2020. In the absence of federal standards, states can set their own efficiency requirements. Consensus agreements like those not only ensure significant energy savings, but also provide certainty for manufacturers who sell appliances throughout the country. Industry wants us to put these standards in place. Uh, I have a letter from the Association of Pool and Spa Professionals giving their support to our bill. They say, quote, having a uniform national standard is easier for our members to implement than having a patchwork in which some states have standards and some do not, end quote. So these standards may make a great joke uh, for, uh, for some people, but real businesses, people who make their livelihoods out of this business, want their products to be energy efficient. So I would, um, I, I, I would uh, hope that uh, we would not accept uh, these in block amendments. And without objection, the letter that I referred to uh, will be made part of the record. Uh, will the chairman yield for I'll just be, one? I'd be happy to yield. Mr. Chairman, I, I, I thank you for yielding to me. And I'm, I've been informed that the manufacturers want it because it increases the cost of their machines to the caterer on the street who's trying to make a living and to the, the, the people that are providing water coolers for their employees. It just uh, increases costs to the, to the consumer and to the little guy. And, and that's why I think these mandates ought to be lifted. I think the, uh, reclaiming my time, I think the little guy no, likes to know that, that when you buy an appliance or use any kind of appliance and efficiency standards are in place, that uh, they're, they're reducing their carbon footprint, they're going to be much more efficient in their use of energy, it, it could well save them money as a result, and they can't make appliances more efficient. The manufacturers are the ones who make appliances more efficient. Uh, I think that we've seen when we've had efficiency standards in place uh, that the costs are, are uh, not exorbitant at all and the results are a, a major plus. So rather than have a patchwork of state standards, uh, I think uh, the national standards make sense. You may want to doubt the, uh, you may just want to attack industry and say they're, oh, they're trying, to, trying to make more money out of it, but the Association of Is Pool and Spa the, Professionals uh, do believe that uh, uh, the provisions of the bill make a lot of sense, and I think that it says they've been committed to making pools, spas, and hot tubs more energy efficient. I'd like to help them accomplish that goal and not strike out the provisions. I have some time uh, remaining. If the gentleman from Connecticut wishes, I'd be glad to yield to him. If the chairman would yield, just yield for a moment with respect to the issue of cost, I think the, uh, the exact opposite happens here. You have state standards right now that create a very unlevel playing field for these manufacturers. And one of the reasons why they, uh, as I understand it, came to the table here and asked for a national standard was because they have a lot of costs built in right now creating, uh, potentially creating different products for different markets and different standards set state by state. So by creating a uniform standard, uh, frankly, you have the ability to have a, a double win for consumers, to have uh, both uh, a product which is going to cost them less money in energy usage, but also a product that could cost less because these manufacturers don't have to produce ultimately 50 different products for 50 different state standards. They can produce one product. Uh, so I, I think uh, to the gentleman's concern about cost, uh, the result of this could be uh, a much lower cost for consumers. If the gentleman very, very good point. Uh, the, uh, who wishes to be recognized? Can I Mr. be recognized? Uh, well, let's go to Mr. Terry, and he can yield you some time, Mr. Rodonovich. Glad to if yield. Not, I'll recognize you. Uh, appreciate it. Move to strike the last word. Uh, it was interesting in discussion with counsel, and perhaps it uh, should be vetted out a little bit more, but that 
the lighting section, and I don't disagree with uh, Mr. Waxman, uh, Chairman Waxman, that uh, I think there will be some efficiencies uh, through this new uh, federal mandate, uh, but that a outside organization, a uh, consumer group is the one that uh, provided the information and wrote this section. And I'm just curious to how many other outside groups and environmental groups wrote other parts of this bill. Uh, for example, uh, there's been a suspicion that an outside group, the uh, NRDC, uh, helped write, if not most, all of uh, the next section we're going to discuss, and I was just curious about that, Council. Yeah. The gentleman yield before Council answers to this? Yes. Because I just want to make sure you characterize Council's answer earlier. was just asking where the statistics that were quoted came from. I don't believe And that they were provided by a uh, consumer group. Well, actually, no. The, the answer was uh, a, an organization that also includes members of the industry, but they did not, the answer was not that they wrote the uh, section of the bill. And I will yield back, I will reclaim and yield back to you, Mr. Uh, uh, Wiener, that how much of this bill was written by the NRDC and who was in the room when it was written. <laughs> Yeah. All right. Seeing that you won't answer, I'll yield to uh, no. Mr. Booyer. Uh, point of order, Mr. Chairman. Who's raising a point of order? Please state the point of order. Mr. Chairman, uh, point of order. I, I think it's appropriate for counsel to lend expertise on the bill, but to be a foil for political questions, I think should be directed to the chairman. Yeah, the chair. Well, would you were the one that was speaking. I yielded to you, not the counsel. The chair would prefer to be the foil. To answer. I yielded to Mr. Booyer anyway. Was it Booyer that wanted the time? Radonovich. Take it. No, I, mean, I think that I would just want to respond that if you want business leading, leaving your state as it is in California, then continue to think that these stringent mandates on manufacturing are actually going to reduce cost to consumers. It's, it's baloney. I mean, use California as an example. Look, look at what's happening in our state. We're losing jobs. Wow. We're losing, uh, we're $42 billion in debt. We're leading the, the, the nation and the world in our global warming policy. Yeah. Thank God that, that our carbon footprint is being less. And if yeah. we continue down this path, you, you will, you will, you'll have a crippled state economy that can't accomplish anything, let alone solve global warming. Yeah. So if you want business leaving your state, then to continue to think that mandates like this are going to reduce cost to consumers and make everybody happy at no cost, because it just yeah. won't happen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I guess we have a disagreement. Yeah. Uh, gentleman still Reclaiming has and yield back. Yeah. Yield back. Gentlemen, yield back the time. Ms. Harmon. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm not a nanny, uh, but I am a grandma, and I... Uh, I am proud to be a Californian, as I know you are, Mr. Radonovich. Yeah, yes. But I think uh, blaming our state's fiscal problems on uh, uh, the cutting edge uh, uh, green technology programs in California is uh, palpably silly. And I do want the record to show that that's how I feel. I'm also aware of how some of the provisions in this bill uh, did get drafted, at least with, with respect to outside help, which some of us sought, because we may not have all the uh, technical competence to know what a good glide path is, for example, to uh, better outdoor lighting standards. But there was a coalition involving uh, uh, environmental groups, something called the ACEE, which is the uh, Coalition for an Energy Efficiency, which is an industry group, and then the affected businesses. And it really was a model process that reflects, uh, I think, how we should develop a consensus on environmentally forward policies that also uh, create standards that, that industries can meet. And one of the priorities we had, I've been involved in s some of this, not the, not the, the standards for um, bottled water dispensers, hot food cabinets, and jacuzzis, which are the subject of this amendment, but I have been involved with Mr. Upton in the lighting standards, both indoor and outdoor. Um, I, I think that uh, we all uh, have tried to achieve something that can lead to increased manufacturing in the United States of the products we're, we're regulating. So as this is a win-win. This is a, a bit more efficient technology made in the USA uh, that will lower costs, energy costs for consumers. Uh, so well, the so lady, that is, uh, in answer to your question, uh, what the process was, and I think it was a good process, and the fact that California is uh, inventing cutting-edge standards, which we then adopt nationally, I think is uh, something our state should be proud of. I'd be happy to yield. 
I, I thank the gentlelady from California. We both love our state. We both love the wine that's produced there. And uh, yes, um, we do. And I and thank I want to make sure much that, that that's apparent. But but California is the most expensive place to do business in the United States, and it's a fact that business is leaving California in droves now. You know, you, uh, you may not be able to get away with blaming uh, the Global Warming Initiative in California solely, but it certainly is a part of the expensive business climate. And, and if you want to increase manufacturing in the United States, then you don't want to copy what's happening in California because business is leaving. If you adopt, would, would, would the general lady yield? Adopt, no, I won't. If you adopt, the general lady controls the time. If you adopt what's happening in California, business will leave the United States. Thank would, you. Would, would the general lady yield? yield. I, I, I think we've just heard in consecutive speakers from the Republican side someone who is lamenting the idea that the public interest groups that represent environmental concerns have written too much of the bill. And now the gentleman from California seems to be objecting to your answer that members of industry helped write this section. The fact of the matter is there are enlightened members of the business community who I think understand their own self-interest. And I thought it was generally the Republican ethos to listen when business says this is the things we need. They've asked for these things. I don't, this is kind of one hand clapping. You're standing up for a, for a sector that helped write this section and has expressed their desire to have it. Who are you defending at this point? Will the gentle lady yield? No, I'd be well, happy to. Uh, I'd be happy to yield. And I'll try and make this quick. Maybe the best course of action here is for those who are in the room writing the bill to be disclosed so the rest of us know who it was. I mean, that was a huge issue when Dick Cheney had people in the room writing an energy was, bill. Right. I'm trying to figure out who is in the room writing this bill. Well, the, the, disclosure is a good thing. So well, would the general lady yield? On the different segments. Well, let, of the well, would the respond to that and then just, yield. Yes, I, I'm also. I have no problem with that. I think that's right. That. We should find out who in the insurance health care lobby wrote the Medicare Part D bill. <laughs> I've been trying to learn that ever since. All right. Been passed. So disclosure is a good thing. Absolutely. Let's, 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 let's rock out. and roll. I, I, I believe it is, and I think the members of this committee Recla have written this. Have written this bill. Reclaiming my time. You can't sidetrack. But reclaiming the my time. time belongs, my, the time is. Well, Mr. Chairman, controlled I, by the lady from California. Yes, thank you. And I just like to reclaim my time and respond to Mr. Walden. Uh, I think uh, I, I, I have disclosed, and Mr. Upton has disclosed over over the time we've debated these uh, amendments exactly who was helpful in developing a consensus, a groundbreaking right. consensus between industry and environmental groups. And I would yield to Mr. Upton just to put on the record who has helped us with lighting. And I, have, I have no objection to that. I think that disclosure we is We worked with many industry groups to get the standards that we uh, adopted in the 07 bill and again with the uh, outdoor lighting on, on this one as well. And debated, yeah. and debated the indoor amendments before this committee at, at some length and, and had strong supporters including right. uh, former Speaker Haster. And bipartisan support on this committee. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Time has been yielded back. Are we ready for the vote? Uh, gentlelady from uh, Tennessee, Ms. Blackburn. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just cannot resist with all this discussion about disclosure and about making certain that people know who is participating in writing what bill and whose self-interest it is for. Last night when we had the opportunity to disclose to the American people and the American taxpayer on their electric bills, on their automobiles, at the fuel pump, on their food, what this legislation is costing them, the majority side chose to vote no. So I guess we want everybody to know everything about this except what it is going to cost, and the American taxpayer wants to know what this bill is going to cost. And with that, I yell back. No, I want some time. Yeah. I reclaim my time and yield to Mr. Walden. Well, I, I thank you, and I... Uh, Let's hear about the forest. <laughs> I'm folk... Woody, tell us about Woody. No, that's, that's Walden. Oh, well. <laughs> I may reclaim my time on that. Yield to the gentleman. <laughs> yeah. What, what, he, Greg wants to insert Woody biomass into this discussion, and I just wanted to... Uh, <laughs> what? <laughs> Sorry, uh... I wanted to uh, uh, expand on the gentleman from New York City's comments. Uh, I do think there's times when you need the input uh, from industry. Uh, the council had stated that they were provided the information. I think all of us need to consult with people. Uh, but it was uh, Mr. Weiner and others that had characterized any uh, uh, consultations that may have occurred 
uh, with the bill that he referenced and then exaggerated it to that they wrote it. Uh, so I think it's appropriate, especially under these circumstances, because frankly, uh, there has been signs that the uh, National Defense Resource Council was in fact the author of the next title that we're going to get into. In fact, uh, I know of one instance uh, where someone was sent to the National Defense Resources Council to talk about a change to Title III, uh, not to staff. Now, maybe they were just seeing if uh, the NRD, uh, NRDC would talk to uh, the chairman about changes, but there's certainly been uh, a buzz about that. So I think it's a fair question, and I yield back my time to the gentlelady from Tennessee. The gentlelady yield. Who's seeking to claim Booyer. time? Booyer. I yield to Mr. Booyer. For the purpose of uh, op open disclosure, there were five of us that created the Medicare um, drug discount card program and also created the health savings accounts. Uh, three of us are sitting here in the room right now, John Shattig, Joe Barton, and myself are the only three remaining out of the five. Uh, it, was a very, uh, lonely, it was a very lonely moment when we put that together because it was just the five of us and it was our staff. We wouldn't get any help. I'd say to the gentleman from New York who was so inquisitive, we didn't get any help from anyone from the outside. And so, you know, when you write, when you write. Gentlemen. Would permit, are you going off track on the amendment that's before us? I'm, I'm responding to an allegation. Actually, I'm responding to an inquiry from the gentleman from New York that for years he, he's never known who was in the room. Uh, I just want him to know that yeah. there are three of us that are here that when we put together the drug discount card program and create health savings accounts, we did it ourselves. Is this a disclosure so or a confession? <laughs> well, I. I will uh, accept responsibility because it's been a good program to the benefit of seniors. I yield back to the gentlelady. Are we, uh, the gentlelady still has a minute. Are you re willing to yield it back? Mr. Chairman, I am grateful for the time and I will yield back the remainder of my time. Thank the gentlelady. Are we ready to go forward and vote on this? Then let's proceed to a vote. Uh, do you want to have a roll call vote? The clerk will call the roll. Those in favor of the Radonovich amendments in block <coughs> say aye. Those opposed will vote no. Mr. Wax Mr. Waxman. No. Mr. Waxman, no. Mr. Dingle. Mr. Markey. Mr. Markey, no. Mr. Boucher. Mr. Pallone, Mr. Gordon, Ms. Esch, I'm sorry, Mr. Rush, Ms. Eshu, Ms. Eshu votes no. Mr. Stupak, Mr. Stupak, no. Mr. Engel, Mr. Engel, no. Mr. Green, Ms. Deget. Ms. Get votes no. Mrs. Caps. Mrs. Caps votes no. Mr. Doyle. Mr. Doyle votes no. Ms. Harmon. Ms. Harmon votes no. Ms. Ms. Schakowsky. Ms. Schakowsky votes no. Mr. Gonzalez. Mr. Inslee. Mr. Inslee votes no. Ms. Baldwin. Ms. Baldwin votes no. Mr. Ross. Mr. Ross, no. Mr. Weiner. No. Mr. Weiner, no. Mr. Matheson. No. Mr. Matheson, no. Mr. Butterfield. No. Mr. Butterfield, no. Mr. Melison. No. Mr. Melison, no. Mr. Barrow. Mr. Barrow votes no. Mr. Hill. Mr. Hill, no. Ms. Matsui. Ms. Matsui votes no. Mrs. Christensen. Mrs. Christensen votes no. Ms. Castor. 
Ms. Castor, no. Mr. Sarbanes, Mr. Sarbanes, no. Mr. Murphy of Connecticut, Mr. Murphy, no. Mr. Space, Mr. Space, no. Mr. McNerney, Mr. McNerney, no. Ms. Sutton, Ms. Sutton, no. Mr. Braley, Mr. Welch, Mr. Welch, no. Mr. Barton, Mr. Barton votes aye. Mr. Hall, Mr. Hall, aye. Mr. Upton, Mr. Upton, aye. Mr. Stearns, Mr. Deal, Mr. Whitfield, Mr. Whitfield, aye. Mr. Shimkus, Mr. Shimkus, aye. Mr. Shattuck, Mr. Shattuck, aye. Mr. Blunt, Mr. Blunt votes aye. Mr. Boyer, Mr. Boyer votes aye. Mr. Radonovich, Mr. Radonovich, aye. Mr. Pitts, Mr. Pitts, aye. Ms. Bono Mack, Ms. Bono Mack, aye. Mr. Walden, Mr. Walden, aye. Mr. Terry, Mr. Rogers, Mr. Rogers, aye. Mrs. Myrick, Mr. Sullivan, Mr. Sullivan votes aye. Mr. Murphy, Pennsylvania, Mr. Murphy, Pennsylvania, aye. Mr. Burgess, Mr. Burgess, aye. Ms. Blackburn, Ms. Blackburn votes aye. Mr. Gingry, Mr. Scullis, Mr. Scullis votes aye. Mr. Boucher, Mr. Boucher votes no. Mr. Dingle, Mr. Dingle votes no. Mr. Green. Mr. Green votes no. Mr. Rush. Mr. Rush, no. Mr. Deal. Mr. Deal votes aye. Mr. Stearns. Mr. Stearns, aye. Mr. Gingry. Mr. Gingry, aye. Mr. Gonzalez. Mr. Gonzalez, no. Mr. Terry. Mr. Terry votes aye. Mr. Pallone. No. Mr. Pallone votes no. Have all members responded to the uh, call of the roll? If, if, if no member seeks recognition, the clerk will tally the vote. On that vote, Mr. Chairman, the yeas were 22 and the nays were 34. The yeas were, the ayes were? 22, the noes were 34. 22 ayes, 34 noes, the amendment's not agreed to. We have some votes on the House floor. We'll recess to respond to those votes and return. Are they votes? It's, it's not a vote? 
Oh, 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 oh okay. Uh, uh, the chair is mistaken. That's not a vote. Um, Mr. S <laughs> Space, do you wish to be recognized? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. I seek recognition in order to engage in a brief uh, Gen conversation. Gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I would like to engage in a brief uh, colloquy with my friend and colleague from California, Ms. Harmon, whose uh, work has been tireless and effective in, uh, in bringing to this bill some progressive uh, and uh, important efficiency measures regarding both indoor and outdoor lighting. Uh, however, I do wish to note that uh, my district in Ohio is one which uh, still depends on manufacturing for thousands of jobs, and one of our larger manufacturers in the, districts, uh, in the district makes uh, luminaires for outdoor lighting. Uh, this company's representatives have told me that they are concerned that the outdoor lighting provisions and standards in this bill move too fast and too far and potentially could force the company to close a major plant in my district. Uh, will you, uh, Ms. Harmon, and the chairman agree to work with me to ensure that the outdoor lighting standards do not impose undue uh, burdens on U.S. manufacturing and uh, help save American jobs? Um, thank you for yielding to me, Mr. Space. I can assure you that the goal uh, that I know Mr. Uh, Upton shares is to promote manufacturing of more efficient uh, light bulbs and luminaires in the United States. Uh, that's the whole point behind uh, uh, our Section 211, which uh, follows closely on, on the consensus section we were able to draft for indoor lighting that is now uh, law. It was in the 2007 bill. And, um, Discussions with key stakeholders, including uh, the manufacturer in your district, uh, are ongoing, and uh, significant progress has been made. Uh, many of the negotiators are the same people with whom we worked on the 2007 indoor lighting consensus, and I am sure that we will, I am absolutely confident that we can uh, address the problem that your manufacturer is facing and hopefully lead to uh, better jobs. Uh, manufacturing better products in your district. I thank the lady for her hard and good work and uh, her assurances and yield back. Um, and if I could just make one other point, Ms. Mr. Space, and, and that is that uh, the bill would save, as written, uh, 58 billion kilowatt hours of electricity every, every year, a little more than 1 percent of all the electricity consumed in the United States. Uh, put another way, it would be equal to the annual output of 16 typical coal-fired power plants. And uh, there's a, an enormous range of groups that endorse uh, Section 211. Uh, and I do want to just state for the record, in, in response to an earlier question of Mr. Walden, uh, that it's, the bill was, is supported by the National Electrical Manufacturing Association, NEMA, which represents the entire industry, uh, and that a number of firms, especially Phillips, were very helpful as we prepared the bill, as was the NRDC. And these are consensus standards that the industry and environmental groups uh, uh, support. And of course, uh, Mr. Space and others on this committee, uh, a goal is to promote manufacturing in the U.S. and save American jobs. Will the gentlelady yield? I'd yield to Mr. I, it's I, Mr. Space's time. He I yield. I'd just like to add to this brilliant colloquy, if, if I might, uh, that is that it, we noted that the standards that we changed in the 07 bill, if they applied to the rest of the world, we would actually reduce carbon by 550 million tons from the indoor lighting changes. Uh, this is another step forward in that degree, and it was a, a worthwhile separate bill that we introduced. I'm glad that it's included. Of course, we want to work with the gentleman from Ohio and all states to try and keep those jobs here, but more importantly, bring jobs back that have left building these other light bulbs, and we've already seen that happen uh, with the standards that we changed uh, on indoor lighting that take effect in 2012. I thank the gentleman for his input. I uh, find it refreshing that we agree on something. And uh, with that... Uh, would, would the gentleman... We don't agree on the Buckeyes, but other than that... <laughs> would, would the gentleman yield? Would, Certainly. Would the, thank you, because I, I concur and, and appreciate the input. And in fact, my home state of Oregon, I think, has installed on a per capita basis more fluorescent lights than anybody else. And so we've had enormous energy savings. And these little things add up and they make a big difference. And I commend you all for your work on it. I thank the gentleman. Yield back. Gentleman yields back his time. Uh, we're now uh, 
looking to the uh, Republican side of the aisle. And Mr. Terry, I understand you have an amendment. Yes, I have an amendment. And that's the Title II, and, it's, and it uh, meets the qualification on the time period, so the clerk will report the amendment. Yes, it does. And by the way, it's uh, Terry uh, 044. Four. Let's have the amendment. And it does comply. It's been here since yesterday. Okay. Yeah, sorry, wrong one. <laughs> Changed up on you. Okay, glad you said that. <laughs> <laughs> Which one did you think I was offering? Because maybe I will. Just kidding. 4-4. Four, 4-2. Four. Four, two. Four, two. Yeah, I'm going to stick with 4-4. Four, four. I don't even. It's numbered right here. No, it's so. not. It's no. Amendment offered by Mr. Terry of Nebraska. In Section 822 of the Clean Air Act, yep. as added by Section 223, at the end of subsection A2, add international indirect land use changes. Without objection, the amendment will be considered as read and we'll wait a, a, a minute uh, as it's being distributed. Uh, Chair uh, recognizes Mr. Terry for five minutes. Thank you. Uh, this is going to be even less lively uh, than exciting as light bulbs and jacuzzis. But uh, I've, I've got to educate uh, some of my colleagues because they've probably never heard of the International Indirect Land Exchange or uh, land use. Uh, this all uh, derives from biofuels. This is a big package of not only energy independence, but reducing uh, carbon emissions. Uh, what the EPA is doing right now with biofuels is taking a life cycle uh, all the way from creation of the seed and growing that plant to be used as seed uh, all the way from the then planting for the use of a biofuel to weed control, spraying, all of those type of things, uh, transportation of uh, you know, harvest, transportation, all of that. And then saying that because of the carbon that's part of this life cycle, and that some, whether it's soybeans for soy diesel or corn for ethanol or ostensibly even for cellulosic uh, using algae and other things, they make a leap of logic that really defies logic in that because part of a uh, corn or soy uh, was used in the making of a biofuel, uh, they leap to logic saying that therefore somewhere in South America or Central America or Madagascar or wherever that a similar acre of land has now been displaced from rainforest or prairie uh, that absorbs and now uh, we have to offset that acre of land that's been mysteriously displaced because of an acre of uh, corn that was used for biofuels in Nebraska. Uh, first of all, it doesn't make a, lo a lot of sense. Let me go through why this is silly that the EPA even has a rule on this. And in order to protect biofuels, we need to adopt this language to prevent them from doing the international indirect land use uh, philosophy and rule here. Uh, first of all, genetically modified organisms have increased the amount of starch that's used uh, or that's inherent in the kernel of corn that's used for ethanol 
meaning that we use. Mr. Chairman, the committee is not in order. It's, it's just it's just really too loud, and this is pretty uh, specific stuff. And I can see why. Because committee this, will please come to order. This this is kind of not sexy stuff of accusing the bill of being written by outside environmental. This is more in the weed stuff, but. Uh, so to sit there and say acre for acre when they don't even understand how a little bit of corn is used to create the gallon of ethanol uh, or biodiesel, it doesn't take into account that even the residual, the distilled grains come up, still are sent to uh, livestock operations uh, for feed. So that isn't uh, counted into the process here. Uh, the ag industry anticipates that the volume of grain per acre is going to create uh, increase by 55 percent over the next uh, 10 to 15 years, uh, whereas EPA is saying that it's only going to go up oh, something like 10 or 15 percent. Uh, and the whole point is that we are uh, adapting and being much more efficient in the creation of biofuels to the point where it's not logical, it's absurd to sit here and say that uh, an acre of land of corn or soy uh, beans is going to require a foreign country then to have to plow into the rainforest and create an acre to replace that acre of so-called food, which is, by the way, feed for livestock. Uh, so for example, are we going to say that if Brazil uh, plows under a some ground and eliminates an acre that it's not because of economy in Brazil but because Nebraska uh, used some of their corn for uh, or Iowa or Indiana or Ohio or anywhere else uh, where some of their uh, livestock feed may have gone into a biofuel. So uh, this is important that we lay this to rest right now and I would encourage uh, my colleagues to support this important pro-farm, pro-ag amendment. General's, gentlemen's time has expired. Who seeks uh, recognition on the amendment? Chairman. Yes. Gentleman Strike the last from word. Illinois, recognized. Th this really isn't a, a very important amendment. And the history of renewable fuels, especially ethanol, is that ethanol got its market entry through the Clean Air Act amendments of 1990. We then successfully moved to change the debate to move ethanol renewable fuels in the energy security debate. And that's why under EPACT in 2000 uh, it, that we, ex we addressed an issue of, of doing the only thing that we've done in this country to decrease our reliance on imported crude oil, and that push for renewable fuels. And so in EPAC, we passed 7.5 billion gallons requirement by 2012. Then the new Congress, the Democrats in legislation last cycle, thir $36 billion by 2022. And the reason why, and my Democrat colleagues can join in, I think the reason why is because we knew we wanted to decrease our reliance on imported crude oil. We weren't willing to bring in more drilling of our own crude oil. We knew that we had to do something in the energy fuels debate. So the Democrat majority, along with some of us, supported the increase to decrease our reliance on imported crude oil. Now, it's, it's important to remember that for electricity generation, we are an independent nation, if you consider North America. But for fuels, we are highly dependent upon energy. Our only response to the fuels debate has been renewable fuels. What this bill does is destroy renewable fuels because of what Mr. Terry has addressed in this indirect land use in international arenas in foreign countries that we cannot control. So, so if we want to decrease our reliance on imported crude oil, and if my colleagues in the past have had been strong supporters of renewable fuels, especially ethanol, and really this segues into the cellulosic debate, then this provision on indirect land use 
will not accomplish the goal. In fact, it hurts and destroys. And we want to talk about the automobile industry. What has the automobile industry done to respond to our push to support renewable fuels? Well, what they did is they moved aggressively into producing flexible fuel vehicles. And we've, we've told them to do this. This is a perfect example about my friends from Detroit, why they're, they're so tired of us micromanaging their businesses. Because here we say, build these new cars, make them flexible fuel vehicles, and guess what? We're not going to have uh, renewable fuels because of this bill in the indirect land use calculations that my colleague through his amendment is trying to change and perfect. So here's a, a, a good amendment, especially if you've supported renewable fuels in the past, and the Democrat majority did in the last Congress, exp aggressively expanding the renewable fuel use, actually uh, expanding it further than a lot of us who've been championing this debate thought was fairly, really wise. But the reason why I believe you did it is because you couldn't go anywhere else to say we're decreasing our reliance in imported crude oil. Now this bill attacks renewable fuels. This bill will make it more difficult. This will actually move to, in essence, bankrupt, really, in, in, in the Midwest. The people who put money in these ethanol refineries are farmers in cooperative ventures that have risked a lot because of the signals that we've sent from Washington to say, hey, we need to reduce our reliance on imported crude oil. So if you're from, if you've supported renewable fuels in the past, especially in the last Congress with that great expansion, and you uh, are from an agricultural sector that has, in essence, profited by the movement of this government, you really need to support this amendment because without this amendment, this destroys the renewable fuels market. And I'll yield my remaining my 20 seconds to Mr. I, Kerry. I thank you. I can't stress enough that to put the responsibility on biofuels to have to uh, now then come up with the money to buy land in a foreign country is absurd. This is a way you kill biofuels. Uh, so we need to settle this right now. This bill has several sections that embraces uh, biofuels. Let's protect the work product that we've done here. I yield back. Gentlemen's time has expired. The chair recognizes himself in strong opposition to this amendment. It would, uh, it would take a law that we just passed, the Energy Independence and Security Act, that required renewable fuels that reduce greenhouse gas emissions compared to be compared to the fuels they replace. And so we set in, a, uh, in effect uh, that the Congress required EPA to calculate the quantity of greenhouse gases produced by renewable fuels over its whole life cycle from initial production to final combustion. So the law specifies that this analysis must include direct emissions as well as significant indirect emissions. Now, we want to know both, and EPA is processing now, they put out a proposed rule, they're getting reactions to it, they're trying to base it on the science uh, to find out uh, what the, the best uh, uh, way of handling the matter. And uh, while the EPA is doing what Congress directed it to do, this amendment would prevent any analysis based on the science. Uh, if, uh, if there are efforts that uh, these efforts are underway to look at a scientific peer review process. There's a growing body of peer review scientific literature on the subject that's already established that indirect emissions comprise a significant portion of the total life cycle emissions of biofuels. So if we don't include or address indirect emissions due to land use changes, it would ignore a large part of the greenhouse gas emissions associated with different fuels and re re result in a greenhouse gas emission analysis that bears little relationship to the real world. Uh, there are direct and indirect uh, consequences in the life cycle, and I think that the EPA ought to be able to scientifically evaluate it. 
this amendment would weaken the scientific credibility of a whole life cycle analysis. It would produce a far less accurate life cycle greenhouse gas assessment than the EPA proposal, which is based on reasoned application of the best available science and data. This amendment creates a, a new vague standard of, quote, inaccurate results, end quote, would overturn the current law if the standard is supposedly not met. This is not the way to produce valid and scientifically defensible uh, amendment, uh, scientific defensible results. Um, we ought to do it on, based on the science and not uh, curtail the scientific evaluation by an amendment such as this. What? Uh, I, I notice we have a vote on the House floor, and I expect there will probably be more debate on the subject. I'm going to uh, yield back the balance of my time at this point and uh, uh, break so that we can respond to the votes on the House floor, and then we'll come back and continue the debate on this amendment and uh, proceed to uh, vote on it. So uh, we'll now recess. Please return after the last vote for further deliberations. So this committee meeting on energy and climate change legislation is taking a recess for votes in the House. This is day three of the markup. Once the House Energy and Commerce Committee approves a bill, it goes to the House floor. While we wait for members to return, here's today's White House briefing with spokesman Robert Gibbs. We'll show you as much of it as we can until committee members gavel the markup back in. <laughs> Thank you.